Yes, good morning to everyone. Just giving everyone a chance to, to come in. We have over 100 persons, 150 persons who registered. I just want to give everyone a chance to come in. I think we, the numbers are <laughs> not climbing as yet, so we will we will begin. Good morning to everyone and welcome to Barbados Guyana Investment Semin Seminar, exploring oil and gas sectors and other investment opportunities. My name is Grace Chambers, the Business Development Officer for BIBA, the Association for Global Business. This morning, my role is to read the bios of the first two speakers, which will be um, Natalia Siprasad and Derek Cummings. And after I've done this, the first voice that you'll hear after me will be Mr. Cummings. Mr. Derek Cummings is currently the Chief Executive Officer of Amicorp Bank and Trust. Prior to this, he was the CEO of j and Bank and Trust, a firm he joined as Manager Investment Services in May 20. 10. While there, Mr. Cummings held responsibility for the overall effective operation of the bank and trust, ensuring the delivery of quality services to many clients. Mr. Cummings has over 19 years experience in treasury and portfolio management in the international sector in Barbados. He received his master's degree in finance and management in 2000 from the School of Business and Economics, University of Exeter, UK. He's also a graduate of the University of the West Indies, Cape Hill Campus, where he also tutored in financial management from 2008 to 2015. Derek is currently the president of BIBA, and during his tenure with BIBA, Derek held positions as director, first vice president, second vice president, and in addition to sitting on a number of BIBA committees. Natalia Siprasad is the Chief Executive Officer of the Canada Guyana Chamber of Commerce. Natalia is responsible for leading the operations of the CGCC to strengthen, promote, and foster trade, investment, and economic relations between Guyana, Canada, and other countries. She focuses on facilitating businesses looking for opportunities in Guyana or Canada that complement their own business strategies. Natalia is a Guyanese Canadian who returned to Guyana in 2012 and worked in the public sector for several years. She was a Deputy Chief Executive Officer and Corporate Secretary of the Guyana Office for Investment, Go Invest. She, held, she has held the position of in-house legal counsel, company secretary, and Deputy Chief Executive Officer for the Government of Guyana, Own National Industries and Commercial Investment Limited. She was on the management team for several national development projects, including the development and construction of the Marriott Hotel, Guyana and the development and management of several industry, industrial estates in Guyana. Other positions help include company secretary for Atlantic Hotel Inc, owner of the Marriott Hotel Guyana and publicly listed property holdings Inc. Natalia also brings her passion for Guyana's development to the University of Guyana's Council, where she represents business interests. And I now introduce Derek Cummins to give his welcome remarks and following Derek will be Natalia. I see. Um, yeah, yes, Derek, um, his internet is unstable. So Natalia, while you get that address, right. can you? Yes. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome. And thank you for joining us today for today's seminar. Um, 
As it was said, I'm the CEO of the Canada Guyana Chamber of Commerce, Natalia Sipasad. The CGCC is a nonpartisan institution um, launched in December of 2020 to build on the historical cooperation between Canada and Guyana. We facilitate trade and investment between Canada and Guyana and other countries. Our members are made up of businesses in a with a broad spectrum of expertise. Um, including banking and finance, legal and accounting, insurance, oil and gas services, manufacturing, food and beverages, mining, construction, consultancies, uh, charities, security, and ICT developers and providers. Today, we're collaborating with Biba and Invest Barbados to bring you this webinar on investment opportunities in Guyana with a focus on the oil and gas industry. At the CGCC, we encourage strategic partnerships and help find linkages for our members, particularly those looking to expand into Canada or Guyana. Opportunities in Guyana, as you may well know, are there for innovative businesses with vision and capacity to deliver. Um, it is projected by 2025 that Guyana could be the world's most oil intensive economy. And this translates into significant economic growth for the country and diverse opportunities um, in oil and gas services, infrastructure development, ICT, housing, et cetera. And there's a renewed focus on sustainable development for traditional sectors, such as mining, forestry, and agriculture. This morning, we're going to focus on three thematic areas, uh, legal and taxation, banking and finance, risk management, as well as the extractive industries, uh, namely oil and gas and mining. We've assembled a panel of experts in each area from both Guyana and Barbados and from both the public and the private sector in order to give you a well-rounded view of um, what's going on in Guyana as well as skills available in Barbados. Um, to familiarize yourself with the format, we will dedicate approximately one hour to each topic. Our experts will give a brief presentation followed with a Q&A with session, which is open to our attendees. So if you have any questions during the presentations, please type them into the Zoom chat box and our moderator will direct them to our speakers at the end of the presentations for each thematic area. We encourage you to ask questions as these sessions are meant to encourage dialogue and information sharing as well as cooperation. Um, with uh, Derek's internet, I think is still unstable. So I'm going to, um, without much further ado, uh, we'll launch in today's, today's program. And I'm gonna introduce the High Commissioner of Canada to the Republic of Guyana and Ambassador to the Republic of Suriname, His Excellency Mark Berman. Um, His, Excellency, His Excellency Mr. Berman joined the Government of Canada in 1989 as a staff advisor to the Minister of the Environment. And this was followed by various positions, including the United Nations Environment Program in Nairobi, where he was a legal officer. He was a director in the Office of the Commissioner of the Environment and Sustainable Development, Deputy Director for Human Security and Peacebuilding for the Canadian International Development Agency, CEDA, Director of Climate Change Negotiations in, for Environment Canada, and he was seconded to CEDA's multilateral branch as Acting Director General for Environmental Sustainability and Economic Growth. In 2009, Mr. Berman joined the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, now known as Global Affairs Canada, as Executive Director for Climate Change and Energy and was Canada's representative on the Kyoto Protocols Compliance Committee. In 2012, he served as Executive Director for International Crime and Terrorism, and in 2017 was appointed Director General for Consular Policy, where he has most recently overseen the development of a new consular strategy. High Commissioner Berman presented his credentials to the President of Guyana on the 1st of February, 2021. We are honored to have High Commissioner here with us today. Welcome, High Commissioner Berman. Good morning. Thank you very much, Natalia. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, just greetings to uh, esteemed panelists, colleagues, and friends who are joining uh, the discussion today. Uh, I'm really extremely pleased to speak to you all today uh, at this uh, exploratory Barbados Guyana Investment Seminar. Uh, 
Uh, I'm in Guyana at a, an exciting period in the country's evolution. And since my arrival in Guyana in uh, January, I've been engaging extensively with uh, government, civil society, and of course, with uh, members of the private sector, in including the recently formed Canada Guyana Chamber of Commerce. And I'm delighted to see the chamber broadening its reach as they engage with Barbados International Business Association uh, and invest Barbados to work together for what is really a mutual benefit in, in a very competitive and attractive investment climate. Canada, as, as many of you know, has an extremely robust bilateral relationship with Guyana. So maybe I'll just give you a very quick uh, thumbnail sketch of that. Since before Guyana's independence, Canada has been a strong partner in trade and development activities. Uh, and we have seen Guyana grow from a solely agricultural focused economy to that of an emerging producer, uh, energy producer and value added transformative economy. However, the government has broadly signaled that they will not be exclusively an oil and gas economy and will deploy newfound wealth to avoid the perils of the so-called Dutch disease. Recognizing that diversification of the economy is key, the government has made ambitious overtures to foreign investors signaling that Guyana is open for business and that there are significant opportunities in mining, uh, much needed infrastructure improvements, clean energy, generation, education, tourism, uh, and I could go on. I would certainly invite members of BIBA and Invest Barbados to continue to engage with CGCC and even reach out to our Trade Commissioner Service at our High Commission here in Guyana for more information on how Canadian companies connect, invest and grow in Guyana, given many opportunities. One area to which the government is actively trying to pivot is large scale and value added agriculture and agri-food processing. Endowed with a significant potential arable land mass, they're redoubling their efforts to become the breadbasket of the Caribbean. And while not only ensuring food security, the modernization of the agricultural sector will create a host of new jobs in parallel to those in the oil and gas sector. The government's progressive stance in opening up the sector is reflected only last week in the announcement by the Vice President that Guyana's new hemp policy has received cabinet approval, paving the way for cultivation of industrial hemp with downstream value added implications, a sector, I might add, in which Canada has extensive expertise. Canada currently has a number of firms actively investing in Guyana, and just to name only a few, Frontera CGX is a partnership that's currently spudding a well in the quarantine block, which is just south of the Starbrook block that ExxonMobil has already proven to have several billion barrels of reserves. There's also a joint venture between Canada's Crosby Group and Guyana's Farfan and Mendes announced earlier this year that'll serve offshore oil and gas, marine and commercial construction, as well as the residential real estate sector. Another company, which is one of the world's largest gold miners, Canada's Barrett Gold has returned to Guyana recently with a targeted investment in a local mining company. And I understand that they're also conducting due diligence around other deposits in the country. My colleague and friend Yana Sitos, President and Director of Gold Source Mines, who will be presenting later on the Extractive Industry Panel, is a seasoned Guyana expert. And Yana has almost two decades of experience in Guyana, and almost 90% of his workforce uh, is Guyanese. Gold Source ethos of employing local and complying with stringent environmental standards is a hallmark of Canadian engagement in the sector. There's no cert certainly no shortage of other Canadian miners active in the sector and we continue to support their work. Having said that, doing business in Guyana does not come without challenges. In that regard, the government is undertaking a series of reforms to improve the ease of doing business, which in 2020 ranked 134th out of 190 countries. Construction permits and high electrical costs are major impediments to attracting manufacturing despite readily available parcels of land. Notwithstanding the large amount of liquidity in the system, there are still challenges and delays in getting money lent and costs associated with borrowing remain relatively high. There's not a lot of cheap financing in Guyana. However, Guyana's President Irfan has committed to modernizing the institutional and legislative framework to establish a single window approval system for certain types of permits. 
And we're happy to note that Go Invest, Guyana's investment and export promotion and facilitation body, has supported several overseas firms in finding their footing in Guyana, including Canadian owned Amaya Milk, Guyana's first commercial fresh milk bottler that will construct their first processing facility on the East Coast. I'd like to briefly comment on the widely discussed local content policy in Guyana. I strongly agree with the government that the Guyanese population, businesses and workers should be the principal beneficiaries of the economic growth resulting from oil and gas extraction. Canada has also enacted similar measures around oil and gas industries in Alberta and Newfoundland and Labrador. Nevertheless, we understand the local content policy that the government is developing has caused some concern with investors, even though we have been reassured that this legislation is geared at foreign companies that are coming to Guyana to offer services around the oil and gas industry, such as logistics and transportation, that can be undertaken by Guyanese. Guyanese support for Canadian companies has been very positive, which is largely due to the Canadian model of leveraging Guyanese partnerships through builders part, building partners' uh, capabilities to access to, uh, together the opportunities in the nascent oil and gas sector. We don't have a winner-take-all approach. We believe in a win-win solution, recognizing that when Guyana succeeds, we all benefit. I've been told by senior government ministers that Guyana is looking to build capacity at the technical and managerial intersection of the oil and gas sector. This will enable business to compete regionally and internationally to provide goods and services at the same global standards, but at competitive prices. President Ali and his team have committed to ensuring that accurate information with respect to the local content and other policies is made available to potential investors, and we will work them, with them in that regard. With vaccination rates rising and borders slowly opening up, Ghana is well positioned to attract foreign direct investment. With our strong people-to-people -people ties and over 200,000 Guyanese diaspora in Canada, we continue to promote the opportunities to which Canadian firms can avail themselves, particularly with world-class technologies, a wealth of expertise, and a sound track record in the oil and gas infrastructure, clean technologies, including renewables, uh, agriculture, education, and training sectors. It's indeed an exciting, to be, an exciting time to be in Guyana, and Canada looks forward uh, to the positive transformation of the economy and improvement in the lives of the average Guyanese citizen. I encourage you all to seriously consider the opportunities available in Guyana, and I sincerely hope that this seminar is a very successful and productive event, and not the last. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so very much, High Commissioner Berman. And now for that for that message, and we will take your your words and your thoughts into um, consideration as we move forward with this um, seminar. And now we invite Derek Cummins, um, President of the Biba, to give his welcome remarks. I think Derek is muted. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. Thank you all. Challenges this morning, but they all seem to be self-inflicted, but I'll get through this. Good morning, Senator Alfie Wiggins, Prime Minister Barbados, Special Envoy to Suriname, High Commissioner for Canada to Barbados, Her Excellency Lillian Chatterjee, High Commissioner for Canada to Guyana, Mark Berman, who we just heard, the Ambassador of Guyana to Belgium, directors and members of FIBA, representatives of Infant Barbados, and the Canada Guyana Chamber of Commerce, our esteemed panelists, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you this morning to what has been a journey over the past few months of planning between the Canada Guyana Chamber of Commerce, Invest Barbados, and FIBA the Association for Global Business for this Barbados Guiana Investment Seminar, which we hope will be the first of many to come. There is a long-standing undeniable special relationship between our two countries. The goal of this partnership is to foster even deeper linkages through business development between Barbados and Guyana and among our nations and the investing nations of the world. 
particularly Canada. Within the last decade, over 9 billion barrels worth of oil have been discovered offshore in Guyana. Fueling predictions that within five short years, our fellow CARICOM number could be the richest country in this hemisphere. We have looked on and witnessed the intense construction boom, the rapid modernizations, and despite the ravages of COVID-19, the projections that Guyana's GDP will grow by a whopping 15.4%, making this year, making it, according to the IMF, the world's fourth largest growing economy this year. And by 2025, the IMF um, has predicted that the Guyanese economy will be worth US $14.1 billion. In these times, or any times, these are truly staggering numbers, particularly for our region. And it moved us, the Association for Global Business in Barbados, to want to cast a spotlight on this next big opportunity for investors who have already found a home here and looking for new opportunities, or for Barbadian investors eager to generate new avenues for growth beyond our shores. With our vast expertise in the provision of a full suite of corporate services, insurance management, investment management, and the list goes on, Barbados is a viable place to be the solution jurisdiction for investors into Guyana, oil and gas sector, and other extractive industries such as mining and other business related opportunities. Considering Guyana's opportunities, with our history, I must say, Barbados will be jealous to leverage our offerings as a viable business hub in the provision of financial and other business services. Barbados is well positioned jurisdiction for investors seeking to invest in the Ghana market. Both Barbados and Ghana are CARICOM member states and have signed on to the CARICOM single market economy, allowing for the free movement of goods, services, people, and capital among CSME participating member states. This means that a Barbados based business or incorporated company has the right to establish in Guyana and vice versa. Like Guyana, Barbados is a party to the CARICOM's trade arrangements with external partners, including EU CARI Forum, the UK CARI Forum EPAs and agreements with Colombia, Cuba, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, and Venezuela. Like Guyana, Barbados also enjoys non-reciprocal preferential market access to the US market for goods via the Caribbean Basin Initiative and the Canadian market via Caribcan. Barbados also has a wide network, network of double taxation agreements which can be leveraged by investors interested in using Barbados as a base from which to invest in Guyana. This year, our Global Business Week conference, which takes place October 27 to 29, will be focusing on the theme, the new era of global business 2021 and beyond, where opportunities such as this can further be explored. We at Biba, the Association for Global Business, is pleased to be associated with this seminar. I look forward to more of these arrangements where we are investing in the time to discover the opportunities that exist for global business investment. And what a wonderful opportunity to be doing it with a number of ours like Diana. Thank you. I now want to take this time to very quickly introduce Her Excellency Lillian Bernadette Chatterjee. Lillian Chatterjee. BSc Honors Journalism, Carleton University, 1980, MA, Norman Peterson School of International Affairs, Carleton University, 1985, joined the Canadian International Development Agency, CEDA, in 2003. She was High Commissioner for Guyana with concurrent accreditations, accreditation as Ambassador to Suriname and CARICOM, 2017 to 2020. She previously served as Director General in both CEDA and Global Affairs Canada. She is also the Departmental Champion for Psychological Health and Wellbeing in the Workplace. She started her career as a journalist, then worked at the House of Commons, and subsequently worked for several international NGOs. Welcome, Her Excellency Lillian Chatterjee. Thank you. 
Good morning, and I uh, bring you greetings. Uh, so happy to see so many uh, familiar names and friends. Um, I'm pleased to greet um, Natalia Sipersad, CEO, and Anand Bahari, Chair of the Canada Guyana Chamber of Commerce, as well as my good uh, colleagues, Carmel Haynes, CEO, and Derek Cummins, President of the Barbados International Business Association, known as BIBA, as well as all of the respective members that have joined and the esteemed panelists. I'm delighted that this virtual meeting is taking place. When I met with BIBA a few months ago, they informed me that they wanted to connect with the Guyanese private sector on oil and gas opportunities. Naturally, I told them to contact the Canada Guyana Chamber of Commerce, since I knew that the chamber was interested in pursuing uh, broader opportunities in the region. So I am pleased that I was able to make the introductions that have led to this first and hopefully not last meeting of two very important business associations that do business in Canada. Since High Commissioner Berman has highlighted opportunities in Guyana, I will touch on opportunities in Barbados. According to Statistics Canada, Canadian direct investment in Barbados in 2020 was $42 billion. Yes, that's billion with a B. This is a drop from 62 billion in 2016. However, Barbados is still a top five destination in the world for Canadian investment abroad. The drop in Canadian investment can be attributed to a number of factors. Competition from Canadian investment from other jurisdictions in the region, such as Turks and Caicos, Cayman Islands, Bahamas. Also the ease of doing business in Barbados. Currently at 128, so not significantly ahead of Guyana, which is ranked at 134. Most Canadian investment is in, is in international finance, mainly banking, with Scotiabank, Royal Bank of Canada, and the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce in Barbados, with insurance companies, wealth management companies, in addition, we have some notable Canadian companies such as Fairmont Hotels, Gildan, the clothing apparel company, Emera, which owns Barbados Light and Power, and Sol, which is owned by Parkland in Alberta. We have Giant Tiger, which owns Cost You Less, and there are a staggering number of Canadian billionaires and millionaires residing in Barbados. The best opportunities for investment in Barbados include renewable energy projects where Canadian companies could be invited to invest in projects to meet Barbados' objective to rely on renewables for all of its energy needs by 2030. Other opportunities are in the food and agriculture sectors. The cannabis medicinal industry remains a possibility and many Canadian companies are engaged in various levels of conversation. Another area to invest is in local entrepreneurs in Barbados with bankable projects who have little access to financing other than seed financing. The government of Barbados should look at a twofold strategy, maintain and expand existing investment, which 80% of which is all uh, is an expansion of existing investment with a concierge or one window type approach. Secondly, to promote Barbados as an investment destination in other areas other than international finance and tourism. To do so, Barbados needs to improve its ease of doing business across the board. Less bureaucracy, more service delivery online, and define its value proposition. And it would be great if we could company investors from promotion, agreement, implementation to aftercare. The government of Canada and our High Commission remain committed to support Canadian investment in Barbados for many reasons. As a strategy to enter the market or to use Barbados as a platform 
to access other markets in the region. Contrary to perception in Canada and elsewhere, investment in the financial sector in Barbados is an indirect contribution to Canada's economy in terms of jobs and wealth creation. The latter has been well posited by Biba and in particular by Tom Sears of Biba Canada. Barbados' economy is heavily dependent on tourism. Barbados offers direct travel to Canada with Air Canada and WestJet, which is now slowly returning to its pre-COVID levels. My takeaways are, since I'm still new in Barbados and on a steep learning curve, but given my experience in Guyana and with Caracom, here are a few areas of common interest that I wish to highlight. Canada has a long history with Barbados and Guyana and have deep two-way diaspora connections, both in Canada from your countries as well as Canadians living in your countries. This gives your two associations a natural advantage and an open door into Canadian investment. Garrett Cummins referred to a special relationship between Barbados and Guyana. Since I've been here, I've seen that in spades. I have met many Guyanese living in Barbados, and I have been informed that there are many Guyanese with Barbadian roots. If you can find ways to work synergistically instead of competitively, Canadian investment in the oil and gas sector, as well as many other sectors, such as construction, tourism and hospitality, agriculture and food production, this could be a win-win for both countries. And you can count on the Canadian High Commission in Barbados and OECS countries to support both Barbados and Guyana in increasing trade opportunities with Canada. I thank you and I look forward to your comments. <laughs> thank you so much, Hi, Commissioner. Appreciate those words. It is now my pleasure to introduce um, our session leaders for today. First, Renata Mohammed, Director, Investment Management at Invest Barbados. Renata Mohammed is a qualified and experienced professional in the field of business development, marketing, public relations, and communication. Having led leadership, held leadership positions in the public and private sector finance, trade, education, and hospitality industries with award-winning success in managing transformation. Equipped with an MBA, she understands international business and is a previous communications chair of the Barbados International Business Association and executive director, AMCHAM Barbados. She has represented international brands across the Caribbean and has market knowledge of Canada, Guyana, and Barbados. She has served as a Caribbean lead for the CPA Canada and has been a PR consultant to the Guyana Telephone Company. She is the new Director of Investment and Marketing at Invest Barbados, the investment promotion agency of the government of Barbados. I'm gonna have Renata speak then. And after that, um, we'll go back to Natalia for another introduction before we get to the Senator. Renata? Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, hi, Commissioners, Senator, fellow presenters, attendees all. I join our host in extending a warm welcome to all participants on behalf of the Invest Barbados team. It is our hope that by the end of today's session, we will all have a better appreciation of the growing oil and gas sector and other investment opportunities in Guyana, and an understanding of what Barbados and our service providers can bring to the table to the benefit of Canadian investors looking to establish businesses in Guyana or those already present. While Barbados is a well-known tourism destination, I wish to highlight that foreign direct investment and international business play vitally important roles in our economy. Let me also debunk any thoughts that international business is new for Barbados. 
This is uncharacteristic for an island in the Caribbean, but international business is considered a traditional sector here. Let me also add that the tourism and international business sectors are mutually reinforcing, mutually complementary. I go further to indicate that for decades, Barbados has and continues to be attractive to thousands of investors, enhancing global growth and profitability while offering cost-effective, treaty-based business solutions and a quality lifestyle. Indeed, Barbados' success as an international financial center is due in large measure to the presence of North American investment on the island. A quick history lesson would reveal that while Barbados and Canada have had centuries of relations as trading partners, it was during a period of economic diversification following our achievement of independence that a mutually beneficial partnership bloomed in the area of international business. Similarly, the US and Barbados have enjoyed cordial diplomatic relations for over 50 years with the strengthening of business relations being observed after the signing of the Barbados US double taxation agreements in the mid 1980s. As a result, Barbados has become a preferred jurisdiction for several North American entities engaged in global trade, investment, business support, and financial management activities. Barbados remains a top choice. In fact, one of the top 10 captive domiciles in the world, and Canadian captives make up the majority of the captive business followed by US captives. Our banking sector benefits from a strong presence of leading Canadian banks, some of which have been operating on the island for over a century. Central to the Barbados value proposition for Canadian and other investors has been a welcoming investment climate that features a well-regulated and business-friendly environment that supports businesses of substance, excellent infrastructure, an expanding network of tax and investment treaties, a competitive tax regime, a highly educated workforce that includes experienced tax planning, finance, accounting, technology, and legal professionals, some of whom are joining us today as speakers or as attendees. Political and economic stability, and again, I add an excellent quality of life. In recognition of our offering, Barbados ranked second for competitiveness among the Latin American and Caribbean countries in the 29th edition of the Global Financial Centers Index. Since its appearance on the index just three years ago, Barbados has gained over 40 places to reach its current earned position. As many would know, with a deep pool of technical expertise and leadership in research and development, the extractive sector is an important contributor to the Canadian economy. The country is home to a significant share of the world's publicly listed energy and mining companies, several of which have assets in other countries, several of which have been realizing the benefits of setting up operations in Barbados. But more about the Canada-Barbados linkage. At the end of 2020, the stock of Canadian direct investment abroad in mining, quarrying, and oil and gas extraction was Canadian $178.1 billion, the third largest grouping behind finance and insurance and the management of companies and enterprises. Some of these flows resulted in the establishment of businesses that have set up in Barbados, allowing investors to realize benefits that impact on operating costs, tax efficiencies, and risk minimization. Supportive of our existing investors and cognizant of the needs of those considering Barbados, the government of Barbados remains steadfast in its commitment to ensuring a stable, wholesome, and welcoming environment for discerning investors. The popularity 
of our innovative and groundbreaking 12-month welcome stamp initiative is a demonstration that Barbados is an ideal jurisdiction in which to live, work, play, and invest. Our borders never closed, and we've received global commendation for management of this pandemic. Additionally, even as the pandemic has caused considerable economic and social changes and challenges, it has recognized that certain key reforms should not be delayed, given the long-term benefits to accrue to the island. For example, the process of fully digitizing the corporate registry of the Corporate Affairs and Intellectual Property Office was started in April this year and should be fully completed by January 2022. The upgraded system will significantly improve the ease of doing business by offering a better online user experience and enhancing the efficiency of information management. What does this mean, particularly for a prospective investor? Barbados remains a convenient global hub and our evolving protocols support our welcoming investment climate. Ladies and gentlemen, this is but a brief overview of how Barbados is strategically positioned in the international value chain to facilitate the needs of investors and third countries. I invite you to take in the in-depth discussions to follow today and to engage with our team at Invest Barbados should you require additional guidance. Our website is posted and my own email address is included. Together with our host Biba, and the Canada Guyana Chamber, I wish you a productive exploratory session. We are one Caribbean, and together through collaborations such as these, we offer a stronger investor package to the world. I thank you. Thank you, Renata, um, for actually that really great um, presentation on how what Barbados has to offer and uh, also how we can do better by cooperating. Next, I would like to introduce um, Ms. Alexis Moniz from the Guyana Office for Investment. Alexis is an experienced professional with 12 years of experience in the field of investment. She was appointed as the Senior Director of Investment in October, 2020 and coordinates and manages the operations of the investment and export promotion departments at the Guyana Office for Investment. She's helped numerous investors navigate the business environment in Guyana and has coordinated a number of local and foreign inward and outward missions and expositions. She holds a master's in global studies from the University of West Indies, as well as a degree in international relations from the University of Guyana. Um, Alexis will give us an overview of uh, investment opportunities um, in Guyana, government policy, and the workings of Go Invest. Welcome, Alexis. You're on mute. Thank you, Natalia. Just give me a moment. Let me share my screen. OK. Are you seeing my screen, Natalia? Yes, we're seeing it. Great. So thank you so much for, for having us here today. I wish to thank the CGCC, Viva and Invest Barbados for hosting this very timely forum. Um, I know we're pressed for time, so I'll just launch into my presentation. Um, so I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about Go Invest, the entity in which I'm representing. Um, Go Invest or the Guyana Office for Investment was established in 1994 as a semi-autonomous body. Uh, we fall under the direct purview of the Office of the President. Uh, we currently, uh, according to our mandate, we have three main functions, investment facilitation and promotion in that we work with investors, both local and foreign investors to navigate the, the investing in Guyana or doing business, business in Guyana. Sometimes it may range from the basics of how to set up their business, how, how to register the steps, 
And of course, it will go to the extreme of us making recommendations for fiscal concessions. We will assess the project and we will make the necessary recommendations. Um, our second function is export promotion. We work with our, our local exporters to access markets, to access new markets, um, to, to match buyers and sellers with products and so forth. And finally, last but not certainly not least, uh, policy advocacy. Oftentimes, GoInvest is, is at the grassroots. We're on the ground every day. And we, of course, will know some of the bottlenecks investors experience and some of the problems that, that businesses face. And it is our, according to our mandate, we make representation to the policymakers um, for changes, assistance, reforms, and so forth. Now, in terms of our investment climate, I'll just like to read this very quickly to you. Um, Guyana's Investment Act protects investments in accordance with the laws of Guyana and provides there shall be no discrimination between foreign and domestic investors, nor among foreign investors from different countries. The Act also protects against compulsory acquisition of property except in certain circumstances. And it provides for the non-intervention of government. Um, Guyana has a very favorable uh, investment regime. We have very generous fiscal incentives, repatriation of profits for investors, open foreign currency markets, uh, relatively low inflation levels, stable financial system, and of course, equitable treatment of both local and foreign investors alike. Gary? Yeah. So the government of Guyana, um, from, from its inception of, of coming into office, have um, stressed on the need for a business-friendly uh, environment in Guyana. We've seen this played in, in the last two budgets, whereby a number of policies were implemented by the government to assist and reduce investment and production costs. Uh, this may include uh, the, remi the removal of VAT on building and construction material, electricity and water, fertilizer and agrochemicals, pesticide and key inputs. It also includes your rating of um, poultry industry. And this is just a few of the measures that the government has implemented to date. Um, they've also strived to improve the investment promotion uh, area of the country. Um, I believe His Excellency, uh, the High Commissioner, of Canada's Guyana uh, mentioned this one in his remarks, whereby President Ali, uh, upon being sworn in in Guyana, committed to instituting an electronic window application process, whereby to ex expedite business registration, permitting, and improve the country's ease of doing business ranking. Um, the Guyana Office for Investments have um, committed to place in focus on increasing foreign direct investment and expanding local businesses, uh, including through the encouragement of strategic partnerships between the local and foreign investors. Uh, the government of Guyana has also stressed the need for private, private sector involvement in the transformation of the economy. We see this in their push for a local content policy, and of course, their, their continuous push for strategic partnership between our locals and, and our foreign investors. So why invest in Guyana? Um, well, Guyana is currently one of the most exciting uh, investment destination in the Caribbean and South America. Um, Guyana is leapfrogging its growth and development. Um, each day there are untold new investment opportunities arising. Um, of course, there's a significant energy and energy related activity. In June 2021, ExxonMobil Consortium uh, announced their 20th discovery which is set to increase uh, the estimated recoverable resources from, from 9 billion barrels of oil. Guyana's strategic location, as well as our numerous trade agreements, um, allow for significant market access advantages. Uh, Guyana has a very attractive investment regime and policies uh, to match this. 
there is need for pro uh, professional and support services required for energy and related sectors. Uh, there is need for existing support and development opportunities required for all sectors. Uh, Guyana has a very diversified economy. Uh, it's not only oil and gas that, you know, of recent times we've, we've been placed on a map, so to speak, um, based on our oil and gas discoveries. But of course, we have very flourishing um, industries such as mining, forestry, uh, our ever-growing services sector, tourism, et cetera. Uh, there are significant opportunities for investors to capture the change in demographics um, in terms of our population and uh, the flow of persons in, a, in and out of Guyana currently. Land is available, of course, for, for large-scale agriculture development, and there are significant opportunities for value-added activities in agriculture, forestry, and mining sectors. So our economic growth. Um, our real GDP growth in 2020 was estimated at 43.4%, according to the IMF. Um, in 2021, we're estimated to grow by 16.4%. As I mentioned just now, Guyana has a very diversified economy. We, we come from, historically, we come from very strong agricultural roots. Um, our forestry and wood products is, is um, you know, notable. Mining in terms of precious and semi-precious minerals, our ICT sector, our services and tourism, uh, manufacturing and energy. As I mentioned before, um, in June, we had our 20th uh, oil discovery. And as a result of, of this ongoing um, activity, there has been an increase in upstream and downstream investment within the oil sector. Now, now I just wanna to touch very briefly on the incentive regime. So I like to say, or I, I usually like to say that Guyana has uh, four, four categories of incentives that we offer. Uh, our general incentives, our sector-specific incentives, uh, special incentives, and of course, I usually like to use land as, as one of the incentives as well. Um, in terms of general incentives, this is, this is available to all investors. Um, and it includes unlimited carryover of tax losses from, from previous years, access, accelerated depreciation on machinery and equipment for tax purposes, um, Investors benefit from our double taxation treaties with the UK, Canada, Kuwait, CARICOM. Um, in terms of our sector specific incentives, this is generally available through an investment agreement. And the investment agreement is, is drafted by Go Invest. We work with the investor and, and we draft an investment agreement. And this is generally the legal document that that allows an investor to, to benefit from waivers of duties and taxes on a specific list of machinery and equipment. Um, these waivers generally include custom duty and VAT rate of zero on a wide range of processing machinery equipment, uh, packaging equipment, auxiliary plant equipment, furnishing in terms of hotels, um, building materials for some projects. It includes waivers of custom duties, excise tax, and, and VAT on some vehicles relevant to the project. Um, it also may include zero rated duty on aircrafts and possible waivers of VAT. Um, Uh, some other incentives, some special incentives exist in terms of corporate tax holiday, income tax ho holiday. Um, there is a framework that guides tax holidays and it generally revolves around pioneering projects, which are new economic activities for the country. Um, there are special incentives that may be available according to specific geographic areas. Um, in those cases when new economic activities actively create significant employment in these areas. This include region one, seven, eight, nine, and 10. The honorable minister may, may um, include other regions in, in this. Uh, we also have our export incentive, uh, which falls on our special incentives. And it generally allows exporters um, to deduct from their, 
export profits deductible from income tax. So it, basically it says, if according to the percentage of, exp of, of, um, of your products that you're exporting, you may have a certain percentage deducted from your income tax. Um, so that table basically guides that. And of course, I mentioned land before. Um, investors are able to access land according to the activity and the area um, that they may be targeting through the government of Guyana. Uh, and this is generally at a very fair market value price. So I, I generally list land as an incentive. Alexis, we're running low on time. Oh, no, I'm not gonna. Okay, so let me just touch briefly on our Invest 55. In May, tw May 26, we, Guyana celebrated our 55th uh, independence anniversary. Um, and through this, Go Invest launched what we call our Invest 55 projects, which is 55, a list of 55 projects um, that we feel that, that is needed in Guyana. This include mega farms, expansion of the BPO industry, manufacturing of machinery and equipment, alternative energy projects for hydro, solar, and wind. Um, a list of this pro these projects can be found on our website. And finally, in closing, um, I, I just wanna touch a couple points. Uh, public investment is not adequate enough for, to, to drive the country's future plans. Uh, Guyana requires foreign direct investment in order to drive growth and its transformative agenda. It requires critical skills to boost its human capital needs. Um, and we welcome foreign investment. We are eager to do business with our trading partner as well as the rest of the world. We are enthusiastic in, attra in attra attracting investment, including through public-private partnership and through strategic partnership between foreign and local companies. Um, so I have my contact information here. Please feel free to contact us. We are happy to work with, with um, anyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very so much, much Alexis. Alexis. Great. So I take great pleasure in introducing Senator Alfie Wiggins. Senator Alfred Wiggins, JP, is a distinguished and dedicated service provider with over 25 years of postgraduate and combined experience in accounting management, consultancy, protocol, and diplomatic service. Senator Wiggins is currently the Prime Minister of Barbados Special Envoy to Suriname, and in 2018 was appointed to the Senate as an independent senator by the Governor General of Barbados, Dame Sandra Mason. She is, a former, she is the former Deputy High Commissioner for Barbados to the United Kingdom, a position she held from 2014 to 2018. Prior to these diplomatic roles, Senator Alfie Wiggins worked for many years in the field of accounting through consultancies with local and regional organizations, such as the Caribbean Development Bank and the University of the West Indies. She also has held positions in executive management, finance, accounting, and human resources. I have also worked for NGOs such as the Barbados Association of Retired Persons. Senator Wiggins holds a BSc Management Honors for the University of the West Indies, Capo Campus. I have had the pleasure of meeting Senator when we prepare for this session, and she is uh, indeed a dynamic professional, and I look forward to having her um, chaperone us or shepherd us through the session today. Um, Senator, over to you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Derek. Protocol having been established and we're surely behind time. Let me get straight into it and introduce my first panel. Um, that heading for the first panel would be examining the legal and tax landscape. And it's with Mr. Christopher Ram, who is an attorney at law and chartered accountant and managing partner of Guyana Professional Services firm of Ram and McRae. The second panelist there is Lisa Paradile, and she is the principal of the Paradile Soda and Associates. Lisa manages a successful law practice consisting of a team of professionals offering services in corporate and commercial matters. 
formation and licensing of companies, succession and estate planning, conveyance, employment law, mergers and acquisitions, corporate and secretarial services. Now, Mr. Ram, are you online? Uh, Miss um, Miss Harris, I hope you're both online and you can hear me. And the questions that I'm posing will be to both of you, as well as questions that we will be taking from the online chat. So, what are the types of international corporate structures that are most attracted to Barbados and Guyana, and why? So, Mr. Ram, could you please take that first question, and then we'll bounce it over to Miss Hardile. As a practical matter, good morning, everybody. I'm sorry. Um, protocol is established. And let me say a special hello to High Commissioner Lillian Chatterjee, who I've known for several years in Guyana and for her sterling work here. Um, I, I think it's true to say that uh, by, by miles, the most convenient method of doing business is still the corporate entity. Um, the company usually limited by shares. Uh, it, it has a number of advantages. Of course, the first advantage is the fact that, um, that the liability of shareholders will be limited to the extent of the capital they have agreed to inject in the business. There are other incentives, certainly under Ghana laws, for example, um, a number of the incentives are available only to corporate entities um, in terms of tax, so that you get in terms of tax holidays uh, and many other fiscal concessions. But the, the, the tendency has been to probably move away, certainly on our, our investment act, the, the, the vehicle, whether it's, it's companies, partnership, joint ventures, sole ownership, cooperatives, they're all recognized as, as investment vehicles within our laws. I don't know that I've satisfactorily answered your first question. Yeah, you certainly did, you certainly did. And let me ask Lisa, before she actually answers that question, to do a short presentation, and then maybe she can answer the question. Lisa, uh, I introduce you now to do your presentation. Thank you, Senator Wiggins. Um, I, I have prepared a presentation, so I apologize if I just, I'm gonna spend the next 15 minutes just going through this. Um, I believe that the questions that you have will be answered from my presentation. And if it hasn't, I'm happy to address it at the end of it. Um, first of all, good morning, everyone. I look forward today to sharing with you what Barbados has to offer to international investors. Um, probably for the next 15 minutes or so. I will examine what are the various advantages of Barbados as a destination for investment and then exploring the possibility of Barbados as a conduit for Canadian investments into Guyana. Barbados has long been regarded as a reputable international business center, particularly for multinationals. The island's modern financial and legislative frameworks have been specially designed and tweaked over the years to provide security and preservation of wealth and easy return of investment in a transparent, sensible, well-regulated environment. This has been conducive to attracting and benefiting international investors and businesses, which in turn support the growth of locally owned businesses. The island is heavily favored amongst investors from Canada, UK, the United States, and in recent times we've seen from Asia and Latin America as having a respectable and stable social, political, and economic environment for not only direct investments, but also for second home ownership and residency. <clears throat> there are no restrictions preventing foreign nationals or companies from investing in Barbados. Barbados has long been an attractive jurisdiction for high net worth individuals wishing to relocate to the island, mainly for a mixture of tax and lifestyle reasons. The island offers work permits, special entry permits for high net worth individuals, and of course, a new welcome stamp for re remote workers. Of importance at this point is that non-domicile individuals are not taxed in Barbados on locally sourced income, and foreign source income is taxed if we only remitted to Barbados. 
foreign source capital removed island and capital gains are also exempted from tax in Barbados. The island's strong legal system based on British common law system ensures that property rights and intellectual property are well protected and an independent judiciary guarantees the impartial and effective resolution of disputes. This is also complemented by a modern banking infrastructure with a major Canadian banks having a long standing presence on the island and a supportive institutional framework for global business and financial services. Barbados company legislation is also based on the Ontario Business Corporations Act, making it seamless for Canadian investors using our jurisdiction. Auditing, anti-money laundering requirements and regulatory reporting meet international standards, ensuring confidence, ensuring confidence in business activities. Unlike other jurisdictions, the identity of ultimate beneficial ownership is not publicly available, although this information is required to be maintained by the appropriate government regulatory bodies and asset service providers. The Barbados dollar has been pegged to the United States at a rate of two Barbados to one US going back since 1975. This creates a stable currency environment for trade and investment in Barbados. Company can freely repatriate profits and capital from foreign direct investment. Barbados has a modern technology infrastructure in place with online filing services for its corporate registry and financial services commission to facilitate the ease of setting up and doing business. The island continues to preacher proof it international business sector with plans to digitalize the entire public service, steered by this Ministry of Innovation, Science and Smart Technology. This digital transformation is underway, having been accelerated by adaptive measures that allow key government sectors to operate to operate during national lockdowns and physical distancing protocols brought about by COVID-19 pandemic. In forging this path, the government has demonstrated a commitment to consulting with stakeholders in the private sector to ensure a smooth transition with minimum disruption to business. Barbados has also recently enacted the world-class data protection legislation, which came into effect in March, 2021. The Act model on the EU's general data protection sets out a comprehensive regulatory framework for the collection, processing, storage, and dissemination of personal data and the protection of individual rights in respect of their personal information in line with international standards. Barbados international business sector has demonstrated resilience and agility in recent years. In response to its commitment to the OECD to abolish or amend certain legislation which treated both domestic and international taxpayers differently, we have seen a transformation of our international business sector. Indeed, in doing so, the Barbados attractiveness to investors has not been diminished. At the start of 2020, the start of 2019, the international and domestic corporate tax rate in Barbados was converged so that all companies now are subject to a corporation tax on a sliding scale starting from 5.5% for the first million to 1% depending on the level of income, the level of income being 30 million for 1%. In addition, Barbados introduced a foreign currency permit program whereby any company earning 100% of its income in foreign currency can apply for a permit from the Ministry of International Business. This permit provides certain benefits such as exemption from exchange, exchange control. This is actually a, a very big exemption for us since um, all of our companies are doing trade overseas are subject to ex exchange control. This means among other things that foreign companies can operate and maintain foreign currency accounts without the need for the permission of the Central Bank of Barbados exemption from withholding tax, which is also preserved in our Income Tax Act. And this is exemption from tax on the payment of dividends to non-residents of Barbados. Exemption from payment of stamp duty and property transfer tax on the transfer of shares. Exemption from the payment of value added tax and the provision of certain services, mainly legal services currently. 
However, further amendments to the value added tax are being considered to expand the list of services which will be exempted. Currently, requests can be made to the Ministry of Finance for waivers for duties on the importation of plant, machinery, and raw materials to be used in the business. We also have an exemption from the filing of annual returns at the corporate registry since the company is essentially regulated by the Ministry of International Business having obtained the foreign currency permit. Additionally, with over 30 years experience in providing international insurance solution, Barbados is regarded as a mature domicile for captive insurance business. This has been our largest growth industry over the last year. The island currently has about 300 licensed active captive insurance companies, the majority being Canadian owned, making it one of the top six dominant for captive insurers. The opportunity for captive insurance growth in Barbados has been bolstered by the fact that COVID-19 is causing a re-evaluation of traditional insurance lines, coupled with a need for coverage for pandemic-related risks that typically disrupt global supply chains. In line with the revision and strengthening of the island suite of business legislation in recent years, Insurance Act has been amended to implement three classes of insurance licenses. Our class one license, which essentially restrict the business the company can underwrite to related party business, which is essentially a pure captive. Class two licenses, which can underwrite risk of third parties and class three licenses, which basically are brokers, insurance management companies, insurance holding companies. Barbados has also implemented economic substance legislation in line with the EU and OECD recommendation and guidelines. By enacting the company substance legislation, the Barbados government has shown its capability to adopt evolving international standard and maintaining its reputation. The act applies to Barbados resident companies which derive income from carrying on one or more relevant activities which are defined as banking business, insurance business, fund management business, finance and leasing business, headquarters business, shipping business, holding company business, intellectual property business, distribution and service centers business, and other activities as the minister may by orders describe. The act provides a straightforward economic substance test, which avoids imposing onerous compliance obligations requiring applicable companies to file an economic substance declaration annually. By this filing, a company must demonstrate that certain core income generating activities are carried on in Barbados or there is oversight and control over those activities if outsourced and a company is directly managed and controlled from within Barbados. A residence company can comply with these um, activities or the SIGA, the core income generating activities, have in regard to the level of income from the relevant activity carried on. There is an adequate number of qualified full-time employees. There is adequate operating expenditure incurred in Barbados. There are adequate physical assets in Barbados. The companies have frequent board meetings in Barbados where a quorum is physically present in Barbados and decisions are actually made in Barbados. A resident company can satisfy this economic success to, as I mentioned earlier, by outsourcing it to another person in Barbados or another company. The, tech, the, the Economic Substance Act also prescribes a reduced test in certain circumstances for single purpose equity holding companies and companies that are beneficially owned and controlled by residents and are not part of a multinational group. Also, an entity that is not resident in Barbados for tax purposes is not required to comply with the ESA, the Economic Substance Act, subject to the production of satisfactory evidence to substantiate its tax resident status outside of Barbados. So for example, a company incorporated in Barbados but choose to pay tax in Guyana will not be subject to the economic requirements in Barbados. One can conclude that economic substance is a subjective test based on the activities of a particular company. For the majority of Canadian owned companies operating in Barbados, economic substance has not been a new phenomena since they were always cognizant of ensuring minor management of the company in Barbados. 
I'll now turn to Barbados as a conduit for Canadian investment into Guyana. Companies looking to thrive in a highly competitive global marketplace invest in Barbados to capitalize in the business friendly environment, highly qualified and skilled workforce, modern infrastructure, investment protection offered by our vast network of double tax agent treaties and bilateral investment treaties with various countries. Barbados currently have 36 double taxation treaties and nine bids in force, bilateral investment treaties. These treaties help to secure the strong ties with various countries and provide an avenue for investment and the resources needed to drive capital into and develop economic potential in emerging markets. In this regard, Barbados is uniquely well positioned for Canadian investment into Guyana. Central to this is the Island Double Taxation Treaty with Canada and the Caribbean and the Caribbean Community and Common Market Multilateral Treaty, which was entered into 1995. The Barbados Canada Treaty is one of our oldest treaties entered into the 1980s, which cemented a strong and long standing relationship with Canada. The Barbados CARICOM Treaty applies to taxes on income, profits or gains, and capital arising in member states. As Guyana and Barbados are both member states, the Barbados CARICOM Treaty ensures there is no double taxation of such income profits, where the corporate group includes a Guyanese company and a Barbados company. The Barbados CARICOM Treaty generally allocates taxing rights and profits resulting from business activities to the member state where such business activities are undertaken. As such, dividends, royalties, interest, management fees paid by a company which is a resident of a member state to a resident of another member state are taxed only in the first mentioned state. Mm -hmm. The latest CARICOM treaty provides that the rate of tax on gross dividend is 0%. Whereas for royalties, interest, and management fees, the rate is 15% of the gross amount. In the context of the Canadian multinationals, Barbados has been a primary jurisdiction for holding company business in connection with operations carried on in other countries, such as Canada probably leveraging the Chinese Barbados Treaty, for example. Pursuant to the Barbados Canada treaties, dividend paid to a Canadian parent company by a Barbados subsidiary benefits from a full deduction tax credit by the Canadian Revenue Authorities in respect of the profits of which such dividend is paid. Further, dividends paid by a Barbados company to a non-resident shareholder, such as a Canadian holding company, are not subject to withholding tax when the amount paid as dividend is derived from income earned from sources outside of Barbados, such as from oil extraction or mining operations in Guyana, for example. Taxes on income from interest, rent, royalties earned by a Barbados subsidiaries are also exempted on the, the Barbados Canada Treaty. Accordingly, a properly structured and administered Barbados company will see its income earned remitted to Canada free of Canadian taxes. Um, that, that's the, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa, for that excellent and comprehensive um, presentation. Let's go straight to Mr. Ram. He also wants to do a presentation. Mr. Ram, thank you so much for waiting. Thank you very much. It has been said that the GDP growth of Guyana is somewhere in around the 44% in 2020. The projected growth rate uh, for 2021 is 20.9%. 20 but it's, this is not um, just a single one year phenomenon. There's, this pattern of high double digit, double digit growth will continue over the next decade as Guyana uh, converts the 20 discoveries that it has made over the past couple of years into production licenses. And so within the next couple of years, another few years, on an absolute as well as a per capita basis, Guyana's oil production will indeed be huge. Now, in order 
to realize this potential, Guyana clearly needs help, support, investment in financial, physical, and human capital. Guyana has always recognized and constitutionally, we recognize privately owned economic enterprises. We have an act, the Investment Act of Guyana, which protects and guarantees investments and the properties of investors in accordance with, with laws that require fair and prompt settlement where, for example, eminent domain may have to be exercised. We have non-discrimination between domestic and foreign investors. And again, an act that I don't believe we in Guyana have sold enough, the Investment Act of 2004. Having spoken about the, the guarantee, constitutional as well as statutory guarantee of private property, we are also, with Barbados, one of the founding subscribers to the appellate jurisdiction of the Caribbean Court of Justice. And that, that, that court has shown itself to be robust um, and quite willing to defend private investors from, and, and indeed citizens, as the, the Jamaican um, case with the young lady um, trying to enter Barbados. The, the CCJ was not hesitant in taking on the, 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 the state if it became necessary. Now, I believe Guyana has got an unfair rap. And Natalia knows I'm, 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 I'm a columnist. I'm, I host a television program. I'm never hesitant to point out the, flaw, the faults of my country. But I do believe we have got a, a, an unfair rap when it comes to investment. We are one of the few countries in the entire Caribbean that has no Alien Land Holdings Act by whatever name it is called. We have no exchange controls in terms of the inflow and outflow of cash. Yes, we do have the Foreign Exchange Miscellaneous Provisions Act in which there is a preference and quite a defensible preference for domestic capital to be available to domestic investors. The, our central bank is not, however, averse to granting permission for accessing domestic capital to foreign investors. So I, I think that point has, again, has not been, been given enough attention. Our exchange rate to the all currencies has been particularly stable over a number of years. They are freely available at CAM banks and non-bank non cambios. We, our Companies Act is based on the Canadian Business Corporations Act and, the, and indeed the Barbados Companies Act. Barbados having been one of the first to introduce the new Companies Act after the CARICOM had set up a working party to look at legislation um, in the late 70s, Barbados introduced its legislation in 1982. I happen to have been a member of that committee. We have four corporate entities. We have no local participation is required. Yes, in the context of local content, that may be coming, but as it is now, and that's only for a particular situation, if you want access, um, maybe oil and gas, contracts, etc. But there is no local participation required for shareholders or directors under our Companies Act. We have a single page articles of incorporation. Our deeds and commercial registry guarantees 
that once your documents are in order and they're filed within five days, you could have your company set up, you have your organizational meeting and off you go and do your business. We have a relaxed execution of the work permit provisions of the Immigration Act. And part of the service Raman McRae, expanding the area of service that Raman McRae has been offering is this question of work permits. The skills certificate, uh, as those in the Caribbean know, um, is freely available in Guyana. Um, so I, I do believe we do have challenges, but um, those challenges, we might have been a little bit too harsh on our own selves in, in terms of the how we assess our, our government and our, our bureaucracy. And I'm not suggesting that we do not have serious problems. Any country that wants to grow at the rate at which Guyana is now forced to grow, will find that it has, um, it will have challenges in terms of resources. On the question of accounting and taxation, because I am supposed to be talking about the legal and tax landscape. We have domestic tax legislation. It's probably dated. We all came from the same colonial past in the, in the 20s when we had that model colonial tax ordinance. We, that's still our principal tax legislation. It has been modified a number of times, but um, I'm sure it, it cries out for some sort of further changes. We have, the, we have both um, essentially for domestic legislation, our taxation is based on source as well as residents. If you're a resident of the country, then you're taxed on the world income basis. If you're then we have the, the resident, but not ordinarily resident. There, that's taxed on, on um, income earned in Guyana. Then we have temporary residents. Um, we do have capital gains tax. We have property tax. Those I, I know are not in some of the Caribbean jurisdictions. Those have not been found in Guyana to be particularly onerous or to have served as a disincentive to operating in Guyana. Our tax rates have come down fairly dramatically. Um, we still have high commercial rates for commercial entities. It is 40%, that's a corporate rate. And in fact, for telecommunication companies, banking, and certain other types of businesses, it's, it's actually, um, but for those businesses, it's 45%. The other businesses are taxed at the rate of 20, 25%. And what has happened over the past couple of years, we have introduced a dual rate of taxation based on your activity. So if your activity is commercial, whether you're a commercial company or a non-commercial company, you, ta you pay tax at the commercial rate on the profits of your commercial activity. And if, if you're a commercial company, but you have um, non-commercial activities, then you pay tax at the lower 25% rate. It is of some coincidence that this seminar here today um, is a tripartite affair um, Barbados, Canada, Guyana, in fact, um, because we do share a number of things in common. As I said, our corporate law, very plain English corporate law, our, our Caribbean courts, our court has been applying Canadian cases in interpreting and applying our Companies Act. Canada is the first country with which Guyana had a double taxation treaty. That was, I think it was in 1987. It was later on 
that we had the United Kingdom coming on and we have the, the um, Caribbean countries, which more in the, during the period in the mid nineties, because the, the, the agreement was done in such, an, such a way that it required ratification by each of the member states. They've all done so now. So we do have double taxation and, and essentially the double taxation is, is geared to avoid um, the double taxation of income. And uh, it, it's a very interesting um, treaty. All our treaties are not alike. Uh, interestingly, uh, th there are some areas of our double taxation treaty with Canada, which are less favorable than treaties which say CARICOM or the UK. And I'm thinking particularly of interest where the, the law allows for as much as 25, the treaty allows for as much as 25%. In the case of Ghana, our standard rate of withholding tax, that is income arising in Ghana, payable to someone who is not carrying on a business in Ghana and is not resident in Ghana to pay withholding tax at the rate of 20%. So there is the double taxation treaty, in fact, provides um, a favorable regime in the case of the CARICOM countries, we have dividends are taxed at a rate of 0%, um, which, which is as favorable as you can get. So I, I want to conclude because I, I recognize we're, we're well behind time that I would like to see, and I speak here personally, Canada, Bar Barbados and Guyana acting not in competition with each other, but in partnership and in cooperation with each other. You know, there was a good time even after the collapse of the West Indian Federation. Many of you are probably too young to, to have experienced the trauma. We did think of joint facilities, for example, in, in, in bauxite, one company producing the bauxite um, or in another country doing this belt, et cetera. There is no reason why using CARICOM as an agency cannot begin to explore partnerships rather than this um, wholesale competition as who is better than, than who. We also suffer, and I, I, I must emphasize this because it, it happens at the, at the firm level, it happens at the sector level, it happens at the country level, given the pace at which Guyana has had to go, we are very short of resources. Many, um, and please don't take this as a criticism, many of our top skills are to be found in Barbados and in Canada. And um, maybe this, it, it's something that we need to think about. We do, we are developing a diaspora policy um, and we'd like to see how that will succeed. But I want to say that Diana is not only on the move, but it is on the rise. I believe at the, at the entity level where we can have um, joint ventures as, as, as the high commissioner, current high commissioner pointed out between Farfan and Mendez and um, the entity in Canada. That's the type of thing that I think it will help all of us and it help to strengthen our economy, um, enhance the living standards of our people. It's not only in my view, I belong to that generation where I do believe that the, the primary obligation of the state must still be to enhance the welfare of its people through its legal system, its investment policy, its depletion policy, its tax policy, its social policies, et cetera. I thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Christopher, for that really exciting and very, very informative presentation. 
But before we go any further, we have an online audience of about 130 people. We are asking them to place their questions in the online chat so that they can actively participate in all three of the panels. So we want our online audience to be involved. And secondly, uh, Lisa has to leave very soon. So Lisa, I want to ask you a quick question. Um, the Barbados International Business and Financial Services Industry was primarily built on attracting Canadian business. What has been the Guyana experience and are there any lessons that Guyana can learn from Barbados? And I'm asking you this question because you're a Guyanese who's resident in Barbados and you would um, essentially know the responses from both ends. So can you please say that one for me? Um, unfortunately, Senator, I left Guyana when I was five years old, so I can't really, and I'm not very aware of Guyanese law. So I think um, certainly for Barbados, we have benefited greatly from our relationship with Canada. But, um, you know, and, and I do have, as a, as a practitioner, I do have a few clients that um, have operations in Barbados and in, and in Guyana, mainly in the mining industry. And um, so they came to us first because they were a little bit uncertain about the political and uh, legal climate in, in Guyana. So they wanted somewhere where they consider was a little bit more stable. Um, I think Barbados and, and I think, to be honest, I think Guyana is changing its, um, its reputation a little bit to be, become known more as a mover and shaker in, in certain industry. So I think uh, Mr. Christopher Ram may, may be able to be a little bit more uh, guided with his discussion on, on that, that particular topic. Well, thank you, Mr. Ram. Can, can you repeat the question for me, please? The Barbados International Business and Financial Services industry was primarily built on attracting Canadian business. What has been the Guyana experience? And are there any lessons that Guyana can learn from Barbados. Thank you very much. Yeah. Guyana, Barbados, of course, has had decades of that type of um, that model of development. It's, um, it's not a path that Guyana has chosen. Um, it is not a path, as far as I'm aware, that Guyana has ruled out. But I, I, I think it would, it would have to be a, a part of a broader equation. Guyana is very strong on its natural resources. And no wonder that the largest, or maybe I should say the second largest single foreign investment in Guyana was the, Demar was the Canadian owned Demar Bauxite Company Limited. Post 1992, we did have our political challenges. It's very true. I think we have slowly overcoming them. Some may say a little bit too slowly. Mm -hmm. But um, we also had the Canadian owned Oh My Gold Mines Limited, the largest single um, open pit mining operation in the entire South America. And that's the point I probably should have made that Guyana as an investment destination must not only be seen as a single country, but as the gateway to an entire subcontinent of South America. So I, I, I'm not sure that, that um, you know, the what if, if it doesn't happen, it would be a highly theoretical and speculative issue. Would Guyana have benefited? Um, we chose a model based on the fact that what we had to offer was, was very substantial natural resources, bauxite, coal, timber, um, furniture, rice, sugar, forestry, just about everything. We, it's, Ghana is, is, maybe it's too blessed. We choose between a, a non-fossil fuel country and, and a fossil fuel country. It's, 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 it's so rare, I don't know of many other possibilities, but I, I, I don't want to go on, sorry. Well, that's fine, because we're here all to learn. Is which Guyanese laws would you say need revision or updating to make them more amenable to attracting international investors? And secondly, is there a program um, on scale 
um, to achieve in this objective. The government has just announced a law reform commission. Okay, okay. The, um, I, I guess, but it's, it's so many things. I, I can't say, Senator, where the matter, those matters will, will rank in the order priority. What I do know mm -hmm. is that there are discussions taking place in, re in relation to changes in the tax. Mm -hmm. And I can say this because I have been approached as well in relation to company law. Mm -hmm. I actually teach company law at the University of Ghana. Um, the, there are areas where our legislation is defic deficient. For example, um, I believe we could be clearer on, on, on things like joint ventures. Okay. Um, we don't have the unanimous shareholders agreement as, as, as both Barbers and Canada have. Um, the, the requirements for a branch, which is a registration and, the, and, and um, incorporation. I think it is too difficult mm -hmm. to liquidate an incorporated entity. Mm -hmm. When you take the comparison, what, what happened is that when, when we had the, the new companies that coming into effect in 1995, we scrapped everything dealing with the old act and then suddenly realized, well, you don't have winding up rules. Mm -hmm. And we have back to the old act, resurrect the, the, the winding up rules mm -hmm. under the act, which traced its origin to 1905. Yes. And whereas in the case of a registered company, meaning a branch, mm -hmm. all you need is a single letter to the registrar of the decent commercial registry saying that this entity has mm -hmm. ceased to carry on an undertaking in Ghana. And mm -hmm. after six months, you're automatically struck off. I think we need to deal with that. The, as I said, the, um, the, the, the whole business of, of the audit requirement, we have a very strict regime of audit requirement, regardless of how small a company is, right. must be audited. The, 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 yes. the corporation tax act requires that mm -hmm. the, the corporation tax returns be accompanied by audited financial statements. So right. there are areas, but I am aware, as I said, I, I'm, I've been asked to, to make submissions on areas that we do believe require mm -hmm. amendments. Right. So it's the, it's the priority and, and how quickly we'll move on those. Yeah, thank you, sir. Let me just pose this last question to Lisa before she leaves. How is the CARICOM tax treaty applicable to investors who are going into Barbados, or who are coming to Barbados and Guyana? I'll let Christopher answer the Guyana part. And how is the CARICOM tax treaty applicable to investors? Um, so, Senator, in the latter part of my um, presentation, I kind of gave some examples about uh, Canadian companies trying to use the use the Canada Barbados tax treaty as a conduit and then to come into to Barbados and then we leveraging on on the Canada and the Barbados CARICOM treaty. Um, for all the exemptions to ensure that there is no double taxation happening at, at, at every level. So companies structuring their affairs will most likely pay tax in one of the two jurisdictions, but not both jurisdictions. And that and that is the, the that is one of the beauty of the double taxation treaties right. that yeah. we do have with so many countries. Yes, yes Mr. Ram. Um, I wonder if I may respectfully disagree with Lisa. Sure, that's fine. That's what this is all I about. I do believe that. there's an element of substance. I, I, yes, I, 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 yes. I don't think you can go and register in a country and claim a nationality. In, it is still based, the, the double taxation treaty is still based on, on residents in, in, the, in the member states. Mr. Ram, I, I don't disagree with mm -hmm. you. I completely agree with you, but um, this is just an overview. And you know, I don't have the time. You, to... you raised a very interesting um, point uh, as to the extent to which you can use a double taxation treaty. I'm not sure somebody's international. 
vehicle for for bypassing the message but can you can, can you hear me again um it's saying your network bandwidth is low Hello? so i'm not hearing you at all and uh, lisa can you please come in here and respond while he has an adjustment on his um internet yeah um, that's a, no, that's an mean, area for um, investment opportunity. So we would have missed um, what you said, Mr. Ram, your yeah, yeah. um, um, internet um, is down. But Lisa, you can make your final statement because I know you have to go to another meeting right now. Yes, thank, thank you, Senator Wiggins. I, I wasn't... Um, I wasn't disagreeing with Mr. Ram when he said that, you know, obviously there has to be um, substance in each jurisdiction. Um, I was just providing an overview on how, you know, we could leverage the treaties with putting the right, you know, matters and factors in place. So, um, you know, that is obviously a very much broader discussion than this. And, and, and there are lots of tax planners probably on this um, on, on this panel that could probably answer that question. And, and but this is, I didn't think this was the, the focus today, but definitely um, on a broader scale. Um, I don't disagree with, with Mr. Ram what he has to say. Thank you very much, Lisa, for your participation. And we hope to see you again on the next seminar. Thank you so much. Mr. Thanks Ram, much. you're most welcome. What I wanted to ask you, uh, Mr. Ram, you made earlier in your presentation a comment in relation to Diana getting on fair rack to investment. Can you please expand further? And then how does your central bank then um, zero in on this um, unfair rap that you're talking about? Well, can you hear me any better now? Yes, please. And I did make the point that the, the narrow bandwidth is probably an area for investment opportunity for now for um, for us. <laughs> Well, I, 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 did, I did give an example. Um, you, you don't, or I give examples. You do not need to have foreign shareholders. You do not need to have foreign directors. Um, we don't have alien land holdings. Um, yes, um, for an external company, which is a branch, to, to have an interest in land, you do need a license from the president. But overall, it's, it's pretty simple. In terms of the, of the raising of funds on the domestic market, the Bank of Guyana, there is no law against it. It is simply that it is done on a case by case basis. So that if you do want to raise money in Guyana, whether by way of an overdraft, a loan or a bond, you have to get permission from the central bank. And such permission is not unreasonably withheld. Um, so I heard planning permission. Yes, we do have we do have issues. We you know maybe we have too many levels of government. So you have the central housing and planning, then you have the local government authorities. Um, you have the regions. So maybe some kind of consolidation, and and some work on deciding. Well, look. Now that we have an expanding economy, we'll have to have expanding geographical space for commercial activities. But we'd also want, everybody wants to be around Georgetown and its environs. Uh, yes, that's because of electricity, that's because, uh, well, partly electricity, partly telephone, partly roads, um, everything happens in Georgetown. But our, our, our city has been expanding, it will continue to expand. I think the government is interested in getting persons, which is why we have in one of the old sugar estates, um, the Wales Development Authority, which, which will have lands available, electricity available, and, and perhaps other utilities available to, to encourage and promote persons and facilitate them going outside of, of Georgetown. Thank you, sir. Let's take a question from the chat. How do civil society or nonprofit organizations fall within this framework of doing business in Guyana? And what taxation, uh, and what are the taxation and the legal commitments? Well, the 
sorry, the under the Co Cooperatives Act, there is no taxation. And um, I guess that you could consider a mix of civil society and private business. What we don't have, Senator, and this is something that the CARICOM Working Party had, rec had recommended. Guyana failed to do it. The recommendation was that you have a single companies act, you have an act for nonprofit, and you had one for insolvency. I think Barbados is the only country in the Caribbean that did, did all three. Guyana does not have um, any company limited by guarantee, and all these companies must have shareholders. That's a weakness in our legislation. And, and I know that um, I know that the civil society is, is not happy with it. It often forces them to go and form a company, which is which is often unnecessary to get around the tax situation. But as a as a citizen or as it is, as a legal resident, the tax system does not discriminate. Yes, you have different tax rates, you have different tax incentives. Overall, there is no discrimination. And in some cases, as I said in, in the question, in the case of the cooperatives, it actually favors civil society. What we need, we badly need um, nonprofit organizations or charity legislation. And, and I would like to see, I would like to see that being put uh, um, high up on the agenda in the interest of civil society. Thank you so much, Mr. Ram. This has been a very, very interesting discussion and we can go on for a longer time, but we have two more panels coming up. So I wish to thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. A lot of critical information came out in both your presentation and Lisa's presentation. And I hope that it can be available to all of our online participants afterwards. So I wish to thank you so much right now and we will take a short break and return to panel number two. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. We are ready to start panel number two.
Panel number two deals with banking, finance, and risk management solutions. And we have Charmaine Oxley, and I'll read her bio. She's the assistant director heading the policy, regulatory, and issuance division of the bank supervision of Guyana. Her remit includes licensing of financial institutions, money transfer agencies, and cambios, monitoring licensees, compliance with re relevant legislation and guidelines, financial sector analysis, and development of related guidelines and policies. Sharman Oxley is a graduate of the University of Guyana, where she obtained a BSc in accounting and is also a member of the ACCA. She joined the Bank of Guyana in 1997 as an assistant financial analyst in the bank supervision department. Our second panelist is Mr. Richard Isava. Mr. Richard Isava was appointed the managing director of Guyana American's Merchant Bank. In January 2018, he was appointed executive director of the Guyana Bank for Trade and Industry Limited, having full operational responsibility for GBTI. He held his position until September 2020. He is the former chairman of the Guyana Association of Bankers and currently sits as a director on Gabby's board. He's also a director on the board of Guyana Bank for Trade and Industry Limited. Mr. Rocky Hanuman, he is the manager investment banking at Guyana America's Merchant Bank and deals largely in loan syndications, project finance, and capital markets in Guyana. He also has previously worked as a corporate attorney in both Trinidad and Guyana. Mr. Justin Cole, he is an experienced executive who has managed several companies in the international business sector in Barbados over the past 14 years. Justin has been the leading management services department at DGM Financial Group since 2016, providing management and accounting services to various clients across the number of business sectors. Justin provides leadership and guidance to the team, as well as assisting with the overall business development and strategic direction of the company. He's a chartered professional accountant who graduated from Queen's University in Canada with a Bachelor of Commerce degree. Now, we're gonna have uh, some presentations and let us start with a presentation from Charmaine Oxley. Ms. Oxley, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wiggins. Good morning to you and good morning everyone on some good morning virtual trade mission today. Thank you. Um, my task is a simple one today to give you an overview of one of the main responsibilities of the Bank of Guyana. Uh, the Bank of Guyana is the central bank for Guyana. And in this capacity, it has supervisory and regulatory authority for several sectors, it includes commercial banks, depository and non-depository taking non-financial institutions. We also supervise insurance companies as well as brokers and agents. We supervise pensions, payment systems, sorry, payment systems, money transfer agencies and their agents, cambios, and last and certainly not least, credit bureau. Each of the sectors mentioned are governed by a specific piece of legislation and the accompanying guidelines and regulations where necessary. Now in our role as supervisory authority, we are responsible for licensing operators that enter the sector. The licensing process for each sector is detailed in its specific legislation and guide guidelines, and they're all available on our website. The submission of an application for our major sectors, such as banking or deposit taking institutions, insurance, is usually prefaced by a meeting with the central bank. And this meeting, the purpose for this meeting is twofold. At this meeting, we provide guidance to a potential applicant as to what is required if you would like to embark on a particular 
type of business in, that is licensed by the Bank of Ghana. And we also use that opportunity to assess the seriousness of the intent of that potential applicant. So before we advise on the submission of an application, the licensing process is very detailed. And I'm just going to name a few of the key points that we look for during the application process. One of the main things is to determine that a potential applicant is fit and proper. It's a key element and it provides unsuitable and it allows us to eliminate unsuitable entities from entering the system and thus causing any issues down the line that we can have. We also focus on the ultimate beneficial owner of an entity that is coming into the system to operate any, in any of the sectors. It's, it must be clear to us who the ultimate beneficial owner is. And this helps us also to comply with international AML regulations and our legislation as well, so that we must know. We also take, like, would have to assess if the potential applicant can meet the capital requirements for the particular sector that they're applying for. Our capital requirements range from just under $100 million for the credit bureau all the way up to $500 million for insurance companies and everything in between, depending on what someone wanted to apply for. Again, these details are all available on our website in the guidelines or legislation that we produce. So those are some of the main things that we assess during the application process. The, the process, of course, is when you're in the system, coming into the system and in the system, you will be subject to certain fees. So there are fees associated with applying for a license in any of the sectors I mentioned earlier. And those license fees also vary and they go as high as $5 million. I mean, and this is all get local currency I'm referring to. So that is what we have. And that's just on the application side. Time limits are also set out for the time that the bank can you take to complete the, the evaluation of an application. It varies depending on the sector. And again, these are all laid out in our guidelines and legislation. Once an institution has been approved, be it for a money transfer or a bank or a credit bureau or a cambio, there are license fees that are also involved. Initial license fees in some cases, that, for example, for insurance company, there is an initial license fee, and then the annual license fee is assessed differently. So there's one fixed license fee upon entry of $5 million, and subsequent annual fees, there is a methodology that is used to determine what that fee will be. On the financial institution side, that fee varies based on, based on the location of the entity. So if the entity is in a town or the capital city, then it's $500,000 for an annual license fee. If it is anywhere outside of that in Guyana, then it's a quarter of a million dollars. And it varies for the, the other areas as well. And that is basically what those are the things that would be impacting any application that is submitted to us and someone intends to get into any of our areas, any of the financial sector areas that we have. And so we cover those extensively again in our guidelines that are there. Given the time that was allotted, it was not um, adequate to list all of those, which is why I'm getting questions and answers if, if persons wanted further information on where to find them. Thank you so much for your so, presentation. I'm not, I'm not quite done, sorry. Okay. Sorry. So in, in the system, we have had some major developments between 20, 2018 all the way up to March 2021. So I'd like to list a few of those. One of the major issues, uh, major developments that we've had, Guyana implemented the deposit insurance mm -hmm. in 2018. That was when we had the legislation was passed and our deposit insurance cooperation became operational in April 2019. 
-hmm. and with members, all deposit taking financial institutions are members of the deposit insurance cooperation mm -hmm. and they pay their annual premiums. They pay their premiums. The deposit insurance now, so now in Guyana, each depositor is covered up to a maximum of 2 million Guyana dollars should an institution fail. Should the deposit take an institution fail? I don't like to say the word, so it makes me a little bit uncomfortable just to think of, of, of what can happen, but it's a reality in the, in the banking and financial world. So that was the may, one of the major things that we've had happen in the last few years. So now depositors are covered and they can be a little more comfortable, particularly the small depositors. Mm -hmm. We also had amendments to in 2018 as well to the Bank of Guyana Act. I'm just giving the main amendments that we've had. We've had several amendments in the last. But prior to 2018, the Bank of Guyana, while we were the lender of last resort, we did not have specific power, explicit power to provide temporary liquidity assistance, which is also known in some circles as emergency liquidity assistance to deposit taking institutions. We did not have that power. So that power, the, the act was amended in 2018 to explicitly give that power to the Bank of Guyana. And at the same time, it expanded the type of collateral that deposit taking institutions can use in the event that this liquidity is needed, there is a liquidity issue and the Bank of Ghana needs to step in. And this was this is a key, a key in issue so that we can maintain financial stability should an institution find itself in some sort of a liquidity crunch. In addition to that, we had amendments to the Financial Institutions Act. And the major, the main amendment dealt with the failed resolution authority. So we expanded and revamped what we had there. And so now our failed resolution, resolution framework is in keeping with the key attributes which were issued by the Financial Stability Board that covers the regimes for how you have an effective resolution process, which is necessary again for financial stability. I, a lot of persons will remember our Globe Trust scenario, if there are many, depending on the Guyanese on the panel, we will remember our Globe Trust. And as, as having a framework like this may have made that resolution a lot smoother than it actually was. Mm -hmm. We also had a, pro, have a project on a, a national payment systems project. Again, Bank of Ghana has oversight for payment systems as well. So in 2018, we implemented the electronic funds transfer so now transactions can be completed from initiation to completion in a maximum of two hours. Mm -hmm. We also introduced what is called the Guyana Central Securities Depository mm -hmm. in March of 2021. And this allows us to electronically manage the issuing custody and redemption process for government of Guyana securities. And it also allows us to more efficiently record changes in ownership and so if, if these instruments are placed on the secondary market at the time, all that, is, all that needs to be known about them is readily available. The information is readily available. Mm -hmm. And it's a significant improvement over the system we used previously, which was not as fast and it had a lot more manual intervention. So this is all electronic. Okay. The, and on the payment system side, the last activity we had, the last, introduction we had, we introduced the Guyana real-time growth settlement system. And that came on stream a few months ago in March 2021 as well. It caters for high value settlement and will settle payments in real time. So it's immediate as it goes through. The Bank of Guyana owns the Guyana real-time growth settlement system and it is supported by the central securities depository system I mentioned just before. So this is, has allowed our payment system to be more efficient and effective as it goes along. We have some proposed changes as well. On the insurance side, we propose to amend our current legislation to include new classes of insurance business to cater for changes in the, in the economic sector, such as oil and gas, and so um, insurance placements. And so those changes are proposed there in the world. We currently have a draft pensions act as well, 
that was the processes that have been stymied due to COVID. Mm -hmm. We had intended to start to get that off in 20, 2019, 2020, but with COVID in 2020, we find out, but that that is in play and it um, allows, it facilitates the introduction of a simplified pension plan. It refines the arrangements for vesting and it also introduces a penalty regime, which was not there before. Currently, our our pensions was our pensions is just placed as a part of our insurance legislation. So now it's going to be a standalone piece of legislation that will govern the operations of pensions. So that, and basically, in a nutshell, is the our supervisory regulatory process in in brief. And like I said at the beginning of my presentation, details are available on our website, www.bankofguiana.org.gy. And you can contact us. There's also a link there for you to contact us with any further questions if you do not find what you'd like on the website. And thank you for your attention and thank you for inviting the bank to make this presentation this morning. Thank you so very much, Jane. And before the other presentations are made, we already have some questions in the chat. So I'm going to direct them straight to you. Is the Bank of Guyana willing to grant additional banking licenses? Well, we haven't closed the system. The process is open. So we are receiving applicants. And it's just whether or not the applicants can meet the requirements. So there is, there is no closed closure of the system. The application system is quite open. And okay. so we accept licenses as they come. As I indicated, we have that pre-meeting where we meet with the, the potential applicant. And because of COVID, we have, and even prior to COVID, we had done some of those virtually. Now we do all virtually. So it's open. It's, it's quite an easy process to have a meeting with us to discuss what you would like to apply for, whether it's banking or non-banking or that those are all available. So is it, the process is actually online, so there's no difficulty uh, whatsoever? No. In setting up, no, and we have all our forms, all the related guidelines, it's all online. So we are here to facilitate responses to questions and queries. I have another question here in the chat. Getting a foreign exchange currency account seems to be quite difficult in Ghana. Is there any way of dealing directly with the Bank of Ghana on this and any reform that is being planned? Um, I couldn't speak of reform for that now. The that process for the foreign currency relation is a, it's headed actually, it's on the Ministry of Finance side. They've issued two guidelines on how that is, how that should be, how that process should be facilitated at the moment. So that is what we currently work with. Both of those um, guidelines are also available on the Bank of Ghana's website, but they were issued by the Ministry of Finance. And the Bank of Ghana plays a role, has its role that it plays as a part of the process. I am not aware at this point of any plans to change that. It may, so I couldn't speak on whether or not plans were afoot to change that. Thank you. We want to always include the online chatter, so that's why I pose those questions to you right away. And our online audience, please don't forget to put the other questions in the chat. Right now, let's go to Justin Paul of DGM Financial Group for his presentation. Hi, good morning. Um, so I'm going to follow on. I mean, we heard Lisa talk a bit about Barbados and our sophistication with financial services and what we can offer to Guyana during this time and how, you know, we can all kind of work together. Um, specifically, she had mentioned captive insurance companies. And I was going to elaborate on that a bit more as a tool for risk management for companies going into Guyana. So... Oh, it says captive insurance companies. For those that are not familiar with it, captive has nothing to do with anybody being held captive, but rather is a function of um, the insurance company being set up by uh, for the specific purpose of insuring a company's risk. So a large company may choose to set up its own insurance company as a means to cover its own risk that it may normally get from a commercial insurer. And that's why it's called a captive insurance company because it is in essence captive to the shareholder. 
So, I mean, most of us know insurance, you know, we'll, we'll get a bill, we'll need to cover a particular type of insurance and we will write the check to the insurance company, they will cover it if something happens, we um, go back to them to make a claim. Um, obviously, very large companies taking the oil and gas sector, if they have plant, machinery, um, various infrastructure, maybe the, the shipping um, that's going to transport oil offshore. I mean, obviously, the, the insurance bill for those companies is uh, massive. And at that point and at that scale, those types of companies will actually have the capital and um, you know the, the expense that would justify them setting up their own insurance company. And this can be used to maybe cover some of the risk or all of the risk. Um, and you can still use it along with commercial insurance if you'd like to complement it or as a standalone by itself. Um, so what I maybe will do is just quickly go over a couple of reasons why companies may choose to set up uh, their own insurance company. Uh, one reason is tailored coverage. You know, you go to an insurance company and they're offering you a certain type of coverage. Maybe you want, maybe your business is specialized. You need some additional add-ons that they're maybe unwilling to provide. So by having your own insurance company, you can add those things on top of it. Um, also availability of coverage. Sometimes, you know, what you were looking for, what you wish to insure is just not readily available in the marketplace or it is too expensive. Uh, you know, you'll speak to insurance companies and the prices they quote you will just, you know, it, it does not make sense. So that's another reason to set up your own insurance company to at least get some sort of coverage in that area. Another reason is stability and pricing. Um, when you have your own insurance company, you can plan and you can keep the rates more smooth to where you need to go and how you have a lot more control over them in the commercial market you know a hurricane hits or you know a large fire in a particular area like you see in north america for example um you know the insurers will have a knee-jerk reaction where the next year all of a sudden the premiums have gone up by a huge amount and we're actually seeing this a lot in general anyhow because we have what is called a hardening insurance market where the insurers at the point where it's kind of, this is the price, take it or leave it. Um, you know, we're not willing to negotiate and the prices continually go up. Mm -hmm. So actually as a result, and, and Lisa mentioned this too, we've seen a surge in um, people setting up captive insurance companies in Barbados uh, for this particular reason. Mm -hmm. um, another reason is it actually creates a new profit center within a business. You know, insurance companies are not out there doing this as a charity. They're out there to make money. And by you setting up your own insurance company as the shareholder, part of what you pay in insurance is actually a profit margin. So by setting up your own insurance company, you're able to share in that profit margin and your premiums to the insurers actually go for them holding a lot of these funds as investments. Um, so that if an accident does happen, they have funds to pay you out. So they also earn investment returns and you having your own insurance company allows you to benefit from those investment returns. Another reason is better risk management. You now have, um, you know, within your company that's reporting to the CEO and everyone else, an insurance company. They're gonna want to know what's happening in that company, what the profit looks like. You increase the profit in that company by reducing your risk um, for the, the risk that you're insuring. So all of a sudden, safety at your plant, on your boats, uh, whatever it is, becomes a major priority. The better you can, the, the more action you can take to improve safety will actually mean less insurance claims come into your company and you will end up with a lot more profit as a result. And these savings can actually then, you know, funnel back into um, upgrading safety. So it's, it's a good cycle and it also gives you an insight into what the risks are. You now have a team dedicated to you looking at, you know, how can we reduce the risk? How can we improve profitability of the insurance company? And they're going to be identifying those risks that you should address. Uh, the final reason is access to the reinsurance market. You now have your own insurance company. So reinsurance now is basically the equivalent of being able to buy something at a wholesale price as opposed to a retail price. I think that would be the best way to describe it. So you can get more competitive prices than if you were just going as a company to the market, to the commercial market to get a quote on insurance. You are now going as an insurance company to the reinsurance market. So there are opportunities there too. So, you know, there are various reasons that people can set up these insurance companies. It doesn't have to be for all of those reasons. Um, you know, one of those reasons addressed very well is more than enough um, to move that forward. And, you know, why Barbados? Barbados has been 
a leader in the captive insurance business or has been part of the captive insurance business since the early 1980s. So we're at about 40 years now. We have captive insurance expertise, good regulations on island, and we have close proximity to Barbados. So this is something where I think our sophistication in financial services um, really makes it a great opportunity for us to work with Guyana and go forward in that regard. Thank you very much. You can let me know if there are any questions or anything further on this. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Justin. My system just dropped out. So um, I, can you still hear me? Yes. Right. So thank you so very much. And we are going to have a presentation now from Rocky Hanuman. Hey there, Senator Wiggins. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Deepa and Best Barbados and the Canada Guyana Chamber of Commerce for inviting us. Uh, my name is Rocky Hanneman, and I'm the manager of investment banking at Guyana America's Merchant Bank. Uh, so Guyana America's Merchant Bank uh, is an investment bank again, and we were established in 1985 with the support of the International Finance Corporation as Guyana's first merchant bank. Uh, we're a subsidiary of GBTI, and Secure International Finance Corporation in Guyana. So typically at the Merchant Bank, we offer three main services, investment banking services, which includes things like syndicated loans, bonds issues, and, and advisory, uh, investment management, where we would manage investment portfolios and act as investment advisor for mutual funds or pension funds. And finally, we provide stock uh, securities brokerage services on the local, regional, international stock exchanges. Um, given the constraints in time, uh, we just have a, a few points here to sort of carry on the discussion on some reforms we would like to see uh, in the capital markets in Guyana. You know, the capital markets in Guyana is at a very uh, sort of embryonic stage of development, uh, but it is developing. And I think there are a lot, there's a lot of scope uh, where we can partner with our Barbadian friends who have uh, uh, significantly more developed capital markets. Uh, to help develop our capital markets as well as do business together at the same time. So one of the things um, you know, we've been advocating for, and I think as, as the first merchant bank again, I think we're cons cognizant of our duty to, and, and our responsibility to kind of advocate for changes to our system is the creation of a central securities depository um, in Guyana. So in order to facilitate better transparency and information flow, in stock market trading and settlement, a central securities depository is needed in Guyana. This is a reform included in the proposed Secure Guyana Securities Act, which has been drafted, but, but is still not yet passed. Um, that would uh, play a, a major role in expediting the clearing and settlement of transactions on our stock exchange in Guyana. It would also lead to uh, share certificates being held in decertificated or electronic form as well. Uh, another reform we would like to see is essentially the reform of the Bank of Ghana's open market operations. And I know uh, our other panelists have, have spoken at length about the Bank of Ghana's operations, but one reform uh, we think we would essentially like to see is, is issuing longer term treasury bills. Presently, the Bank of Ghana only issues short term treasury bills with a maximum maturity of 364 days of less. And we would recommend that longer horizon treasury bills would be issued as this would allow investors to gain access to a wider variety of government debt securities. And these will be particularly useful for pension funds and insurance statutory funds that are mentioned by the other two panelists, which often need safe long-term fixed income assets to properly cater for long-term future pension obligations. Uh, it will also help in the development of a credible yield curve, which can be used for benchmarking. Uh, one thing we would like to see generally throughout the Caribbean is the harmonization of regional stock exchanges as well. I think this will do a lot to promote liquidity in, in the Caribbean uh, capital markets and, and will facilitate increasing volumes of trading regionally and improve access to equity financing for businesses that list. Um, it would also allow for the possibility for automatic cross listing and international trading. Of course, this will mean harmonization. This will have to mean harmonization of securities laws in the Caribbean for, to allow for passporting and mutual recognition as well. This is one area. Um, well, another area I think we would like to, to advocate for reform for is uh, you know, to develop the Ghana mutual fund market. And I think this is one area in particular where we 
we we would appreciate and welcome the assistance of you know Barbadian financial institutions on this because the, the mutual fund market is, is quite developed in Barbados. So you, you know it, it is a burgeoning market. It's estimated that there are in excess of 122,000 mutual funds worldwide with a combined value of approximately 54.9 trillion US dollars. Uh, mutual funds have been growing steadily in popularity since the early 1990s and provide an excellent means for ordinary people to invest and grow their savings. And for mutual funds that, increase, that invest in dividend shares, bonds, and fixed income assets, also to allow people to receive a fixed regular income. Um, and mutual funds would typically aim to provide higher returns than other investments presently available in Guyana, such as, such as term deposits. Happily, at, at, at Ghana, America's Merchant Bank, and, and with the support of our parent company, GBTI, we've pioneered the introduction of mutual funds in Guyana. Um, and our portfolio of mutual funds currently stand over a billion Ghana dollars in assets under management. But it is extremely difficult to create mutual funds in Guyana. I mean, in, in the case of GBTI's mutual funds, they're only approved after four years of efforts, and it's really an untenable situation for Guyana. Uh, you know, mutual funds generally are a great store of wealth, um, a major investment vehicle, and, and the ease by which these structures can be created in Ghana greatly needs to be improved. Uh, and further, there needs to be appropriate legislation in Ghana to provide for tax-free returns for mutual funds. Barbados, for instance, has enacted the Mutual Funds Act, which allows for returns for mutual funds to be tax deductible, and this is something we would like to see in Ghana as well. Um, nevertheless, even without that, mutual funds do provide a, 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 a premium, a, a higher premium that, that will be seen on other investments to retail investors. And we welcome you know, collaboration from Barbadian financial institutions with us on that regarding developing mutual funds in Guyana as well. And, and finally, uh, you know, generally modernizing the venture capital industry. Um, you know, other Caribbean countries uh, such as Trinidad and Tobago, um, and, and, and Barbados have passed laws and legislation which have put the venture capital industry on a firm institutional footing. Uh, we would advocate for the enactment of similar legislation to govern the, the venture capital and private equity industry in Guyana. That's a, a really burgeoning industry. Um, most of the financing in Guyana is really be concentrated around debt financing. Uh, but there's this whole other area of financing that's really underdeveloped. Um, uh, and in addition, there have been regional efforts to the creation of national venture capital funds, which provide seed funding to SMEs, such as the Tobago Venture Capital Fund and the JV Fund in Jamaica. Uh, similar efforts should be made in Guyana to provide seed funding at early stage businesses, which might not be in, within the risk appetites of banks or mutual funds or other financial institutions. Um, so these essentially would be some of the reforms in a nutshell, a very abbreviated form that, that we would like to see in Ghana. And, and in doing so, some of the ways, some of the things we would like, the future products we would like to offer as well, like expanding your suite of mutual funds and, and private equity products. And, and we would be definitely welcome, you know, the collaboration with Barbadian financial institutions and even investors and retail investors, both individual and institutional investors, um, you know, in, in this regard. So, you know, Ghana Americas Merchant Bank, we're pleased to be part of this seminar and we're looking forward to partnering with our Barbadian friends and to discover mutual opportunities for investment. Thank you very much. Uh, you're muted, Senator Wiggins. Thank you very much, Mr. Hanuman. Uh, Mr. Richard Isaba had previously indicated that he had to leave at 11.30. Mr. Isaba, are you still online? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm 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 gonna head out shortly. I just quickly just endorse what Rocky has said, and to, to bring the the participants up to date, there have been active uh, discussions between the Bank of Guyana, the Ministry of Finance, and various um, regulations and and interactions that deals with our lending guideline, in particular guideline number five. The Bank of Ghana is also working with the banks to upgrade our financial system to, to Basel II and Basel III, we, which are international banking standards. So there's a lot of work in progress between the banks, the central bank and the Ministry of, of Finance. Uh, we, we are aware in the banking sector that there's a lot of change that is needed and, and the collaboration between the Bank of Ghana, the Ministry of Finance and the, all the commercial banks, including GBTI, 
and through the guidance too of the Bankers Association, will bring and hopefully in the near future see changes that will enhance and improve the service that we we give as a financial institution. Um, and generally, we I think that there are quite a few questions on the panel that I guess we can raise as as they come up, um, Senator Wiggins. So you're going to leave now, or you'll stay with us for a few more minutes? I'll, I'll stay for a few more minutes. Thank you Just, very much. Especially to see some of the questions that how how we can we can um, address them. But there's a there's a question in the chat already. Does it make sense to try to raise funds in Guyana? with the level of lending rates. Who's going to take that one? Generally, yes, the rates are high in Guyana compared to other jurisdictions for the simple reason that the costs of, of, of funds for banks in Guyana are high. Uh, um, our colleagues would have mentioned prior that they, the recent introduction of the Deposit Insurance Corporation that, that, that provides coverage for, for, for depositors. So a lot of new things have caused funds, cost of funds in Ghana to raise. However, banks are all now looking to be more efficient, to be more competitive. As more and more international borrowers come, these, these companies and corporations have access to international finance, which is much cheaper than Ghana. We've recently seen the introduction of, of, of the, the IADB Invest, who have done a project recently for a group out of Suriname, lending rates are probably like just below 4%. So the banks are aware of this competition. And, and I think generally speaking, all the banks in Ghana, including our bank, will, will begin to become more competitive as we find more creative products to, um, to offer to the Guyana borrowing public. And as Rocky, as I mentioned before too, on the, on the opposite side, the investing population, because what, what, what is also needed is to cook transform Guyanese oil revenues into wealth for Guyanese. And one of the ways to do that is to, is to really pioneer the mutual fund industry or stock market. Many Guyanese don't even know that we have a stock market and, and you have some companies out there that have very high dividend returns and that have been paying dividends quite in the range between five and 6% for the last 20 years. And in fact, some of our biggest investors at the Merchant Bank are institutions in, in Barbados, for example, like many of their mutual funds and the, um, the National Insurance Scheme of Barbados are main investors in Ghana. So this process has already started. The, the, thank you for all our colleagues in Barbados who have seen the, the benefits of our local stock market and, and taken advantage of some of the, the best companies in the region, including some of the best rum and <laughs> banks, the AH and, and, and my colleagues at Dharma Distillers will, will, will probably Tap me on my back for that one, but there are a lot of a lot of opportunities in Guyana, both on the stock market and, and but of course, like everything else, there is room for improvement. So with that, we um I, I would um pass it over to you, Senator. Yes, sir. Thank you so very much. You did mention that you have to reform and introduce new products. What new products and services will the bank be introducing now that you your oil and gas industry is up and, and coming up? So but, like yeah. the bank itself, in terms of um, more online transactions, um, amending some of the business standards, what, what things that you think the bank will be doing now to looking forward, essentially, to accommodate this booming oil and gas industry? Just off, off, the, off the cuff, the, the, the three main products, I think most of the banks, including GBTI and our merchant bank, are, are looking at one would be leasing. Leasing has not been very popular in Ghana because of, of, of the legislation and the rules surrounding the way the, the tax treatment of, of the lease payments are, are, are dispersed in the hands of the people leasing equipment. So that that is something that we have addressed with the Attorney General and, and various other government regulators. So that, that's one. The second, of course, would be uh, what is very common in the rest of the region, including Barbados, Trinidad, Jamaica, which is inventory and receivable financing. Again, we have initiated discussions with, with, with the various regulators to, to look at that and how we can amend various acts that will allow these three key products that are fundamental to, to any oil and gas development. And if anyone is familiar with the um, Exxon um, Center for the Business Development Portal, you would notice that a, major, a lot of the, the requirements now from the contractors who supply Exxon and Slumberger and so on 
is the request for, for invoice and receivable financing. And in mo mo most developed uh, financial markets, this is a very common product. But again, in, in Ghana, we, we are working together with our regulators now to see how best we can start creating the, the, the legislative structure to allow that to happen very quickly. Okay, let me just bring Justin in here quickly before we close off this session because we're way behind time. Justin, how do you think the captive insurance um, here in Barbados can assist um, with Diana in terms of that oil and gas industry? Because I will tell you, insurance rates will be very, very high. How do, do you intend to in, enter any private public partnerships in Guyana in terms of selling that product to them? I mean, we have not consciously made those efforts as yet, but I mean, I definitely agree that it would be very useful with these large companies uh, setting up there when they're looking for risk management solutions. And I think anybody considering um, using one of these insurance products in Guyana should consider as a first step of feasibility study. And this is where you involve um, an insurance broker or an actuary to basically look at the feasibility of setting up a captive insurance company. What they're essentially doing is running the numbers on you know, the type of insurance coverage you have, the premiums and the amount of capital that you need to see if this is all feasible and makes sense. And that's a good first step. We in Barbados, um, we have well, um, you know, we have qualified um, captive insurance managers and all of us have great networks. Uh, where if somebody was interested in pursuing this as an option, I mean, they could approach us and we could put them in touch with the right people to help run these feasibility studies, um, to, to establish the companies and to, to move forward the opportunity, um, you know, if anybody is interested. Thank you, Justin. As we prepare to close off this panel number two, I'll perhaps get Charmaine to come in here, please. To, the in, to investors, the Guyanese risk profile, is heavily influenced by the exchange rate and political instability. How does the banking sector try to mitigate or offset this view? Charmaine? Pardon me, um, I slipped away for um, a work. Can we go again? I'm sorry about that, Senator. That's no problem. I just slipped away. Before this booming oil and gas industry that's coming up, because that's going to change everything in Guyana, the Guyanese risk profile was seen as being heavily influenced by the exchange rate and the political instability. I don't know that that still exists, but how does the banking sector try to mitigate or offset this view? The banking sector, the central bank you're coming up with? Um, that would first be the central bank. It was. We have our, what we've already have established our risk management guidelines. We are issuing, um, we have some in draft currently and we have, but we have not issued anything for specifically for. I mean, but somebody's microphone or some noise is coming in the background. I'm oh, I am sorry. That is the traffic outside making its way in. There's no way I can stop that. I'm so sorry. We're getting, we're getting close to that period where it gets really hectic. Okay. In this area of the bank. So my apologies for that, but there's no way I can block that out. And you may Thanks. hear some music and stuff going on. We do not have any specific um, oil and gas per se guidelines out for banks at this point. Banks currently have their risk management is, um, processes that they have in place and those are what we monitor. So but I don't know that we've issued anything specifically for gas at this point. That is not, but there's always been specific to the banking and the financial sector and what those, the risk that will come and how they deal with the risks generally. Thank you so very much. And it is at this point that we are going to close panel discussion number two. Let me say a heartfelt thanks to Charmin Oxley, Richard Isava, Rocky Hanuman, and Justin Cole. Gentlemen and lady, thank you so very much. And we will take another quick short break and resume with the final panel, panel number three. Thank you.
Yes, that break will be for about a minute or so. So are my panelists in place for panel number three? We're ready to resume. Once again, welcome to my online um, audience. And again, please feel free to feel your questions as we go along. So we have panel number three online. We have Joanna Simmons, who's the senior legal coordinator, Bobby Gosai, who's the senior petroleum coordinator, and Yana Sitos, president and director of Gold Source Mines Limited. Let's just read a short profile on each one of them. Ms. Joanna Simmons is an accomplished attorney at law with over two decades of experience, including service to the government and people of Guyana as legal counsel within the Ministry of Natural Resources in multiple areas, including governance, petroleum, forestry, and mining. Then we have Mr. Bobby Gosai, he is the Senior Petroleum Coordinator at the Ministry of Natural Resources with key responsibility for assisting with the development and implementation of the objectives of the Government of Guyana, which are embedded in the Petroleum Management Program for the economy. And the third panelist here is Mr. Yanis Sitos, Mr. Yanis Sitos has 32 years of experience in the mining industry, having spent 19 years with the biggest mining company, BHP Billiton Group. In his time in the industry, he has lived and worked in Canada, Ecuador, UK, Greece, and South Africa, where he has done business in 32 countries in five continents. He was originally a physicist, geophysicist, and he left Billiton in 2008 as the new business manager for the Global Minerals Exploration. He has been instrumental in three discoveries in porphyry, copper, nickel sulfide, and gold deposits. And with that, Mr. Yanis Titos, I now invite you to make your presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Senator, and uh, distinguished uh, participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for the opportunity to speak here. I would like to apologize. I don't have this beautiful backdrop. I couldn't upload it on my Apple computer, but in this way, I can show you a small glimpse of beautiful British Columbia in the west coast of Canada. So um, having said that, I would like to upload uh, a few slides because I want to spend about probably 10 minutes or seven minutes uh, uh, sharing some of this information with you so you understand the background, uh, the company we operate, as I present the public uh, uh, and private sector here, uh, a foreign corporation that invests its uh, capital in this beautiful country of Guyana. So I call it, as you see on top here, um, Guyana hidden gem in gold exploration. and. This is not just a simple compliment. We see that uh, uh, with, and we say that with confidence. Uh, the word hidden meaning that Guyana was outside the radar screen of explorers for quite some time. And it's only the recent years that we see uh, several corporations, small, juniors, medium sized companies, and of course, majors such as Barrick entering the platform for exploring and potentially develop gold. Uh, projects in Guyana. Uh, from the 90s with the Omai mine, uh, the history of foreign investment in Guyana is not short, but definitely in the last five years, we see a tremendous activity uh, when it comes to this sector. And I call it GEM uh, from a point of view that, uh, yes, it is one of these last frontiers that we believe as explorers in the world. Uh, and the mining industry is a global industry. So you compare countries to countries and geological regimes to other geological regimes, but Guyana has been heavily underexplored, which creates opportunities for people to come and discover major deposits. And I believe it was Mr. Ram earlier who said that uh, 
yeah, the country is blessed and indeed it is blessed because gold is only one of the commodities that potentially can be found in Guyana. Uh, you know, of course, bauxite, Guyana is very well known. Uh, on bauxite, it was the third producing country in the world in 1917 on bauxite when aluminum was a very young metal discovered at the end of 19th century. And beyond that, there are so many other potential minerals because the country has remained underexplored for decades now. Right, introducing the company I represent here, I'm president of Golsos Mines Inc. is a Canadian listed company on Toronto Stock Exchange Venture. Uh, we, are the, we have a size of approximately $50 million. Uh, we are well cast up. Uh, we don't have income as we don't have any operating mine at this stage. And our flag project is the Eagle Mountain Gold Deposit in the region eight, Potaro region, very close to Madia town, the capital of this region in beautiful Guyana. Uh, so just for perspective, uh, the attention is in Guyana at the moment, not only in the Canadian capital markets, but also in Europe, uh, in, 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 in New York and so on. Uh, in May, we raised successfully $12.6 million and we got oversubscribed within a day. Uh, that speaks to the quality of the company, but most important to the quality of the asset and the Guyanese environment as a favorable environment for foreign investment. So I paint the picture for the company and the asset very briefly, and I want to go then to discuss a little bit about the benefits and why Guyana stacks in front of many other countries. According to my experience, as you, as you read, Senator, I have done business in 32 countries. I do believe Guyana is a super favorable environment to come and invest your money when you are an exploration mining company. Um, but also speak about some challenges that we're facing and hopefully things that will happen in the near future, all right? So you see two of our key shareholders here, Vanek Associates, the biggest ETF gold fund in the world out of New York, and Mr. Eric Sprott, a Canadian billionaire. These two uh, uh, establishments here in privates are the two most influential, probably people on the gold business. You can go to YouTube, you see people talking about gold and precious metals, and, and here, here you see uh, two of the most important people talking about gold out there in the global regime in Switzerland on London, UK, talking about and investing their own money in gold source because of Guyana and Eagle Mountain. Okay, so uh, very briefly, the company, uh, of course, is, uh, starts everything starts in this commerce from management and board. We are very proud uh, that we have a collection of about 150 years experience by some executives here that have been and some of them are sitting on other boards or executive positions of multi-billion dollar corporations. So we do have a track record of success. We have developed several mines globally and we want to do the same for Eagle Mountain. We have done it in excess of $25 million US investment in, in, at Eagle Mountain in region eight in the last uh, nine years of operation in this region. And we are at the critical path where we feel the project is reaching feasibility studies to prove economic viability and therefore complete or continue with the permitting process and construction financing for a major development. We have a very strong trust in local talent. And I mean what I say here. I have done business all over, as I said, and, and very rarely you can have success without an extremely important local factor. So we are proud to say we have about close to 50 employees in Guyana. And the, and the team is 100% Guyanese. I'm talking from senior management in the country to operators on the ground and at the mine site. On top of that, we are proud to say 90% of our people uh, in terms of retentions has stayed with us in the last five years, which speaks for itself about the quality of the asset and the quality of the company. Now, why Guyana? I don't want to get technical in this conference, but it's a very important point to say to people who are not technical here, most of you, I guess. Guyana, uh, sorry, Latin American, uh, the, the, the South American continent was connected to the African continent about 120 million years ago. And the same geology you will find in Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Mali, you will find in Northern Brazil, in all three Guyanas up to Venezuela. So the green color rock that you see here 
is the productive rock to host gold deposits, to make that pretty simple. Now, why I put this map here is just to say that the African side has three times more mines and deposits than the South American side. This is not a matter of presence or existence. It's a matter of discovery. Okay, so in South America, we deal with a primary green for forest, while in Africa is a semi-arid terrain mostly, and of course, much higher population has discovered quite a lot of deposits. But that proves also the point that Guyana is seriously underexplored when it comes to exploration. Therefore, all these big corporations are attractive to all three Guyanas to that extent because they know they can find the hidden jewel in these countries. Now, our project is in the central Guyana, uh, is, as I said, in region eight, we control a prospecting license of 5,000 hectares. Um, we are very close to the town of Madia, which is a particularly an artisanal mining town. So with a lot of history and gold production. So we've got commercial airstrip close by to the project and the project is connected by road directly to the capital, which is not normally the case in some other projects in the Northwestern part of the country. There is a well-defined mining act in terms of how you move your prospecting license into a mining license to, through a positive economic study via a feasibility study, what we call in our, in our uh, uh, sector, and of course, environmental ma uh, management plan and environmental impact assessment report in order to achieve a, an environmental permit through EPA. So it's a well-defined act, and rarely speaking for a global perspective, this act in Guyana, the Mining Act of 1989, had a couple of amendments, but generally has remained stable. And what, that's what foreign investors like. They want to see stability. They don't want to see continuous changes in terms of Mining Act or changing the rules of the game when you invest uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in a sector. About Eagle Mountain itself is the second biggest undeveloped deposit in Guyana at the moment and stacks at about 1.7 million ounces of gold starting from surface to almost 80 meters depth. So we talk about shallow deposit uh, that as we keep drilling more and more, we are proving more gold to add into this resource estimate. And, and that shallowness of the deposit uh, creates opportunities when you try to develop. You don't talk about something going underground. So just to separate for you and, 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 and the non-technical people here, you understand an open pitable situation is costing less money to mine, but also you can make higher capacities. You can bring more ore into your plant. While when you go at the ground, you have different type of risks. And of course, the OPEX, the operating costs go much higher. We have favorable metallurgy. So we believe Eagle Mountain is going to be one of the coming development projects in the next three to five years in the country. Um, there's pervasive gold in the whole area of Maria. You can see here our project and obviously the fragmented amount of ownership of Guyanese ownership around. There are only three foreign corporations into this whole area an Australian junior that operates a mine called Troy Resources and then two Canadian companies or my gold and Eagle Mountain, you know, Bolsos Mines in this case, in, in the area of Madia. So there's tremendous perspectivity here to assist transfer technology to local people, educate people how to mine without the use of mercury and, and build up an operation that will be viable and economic for all stakeholders. This is a timetable quickly for what Eagle Mountain can achieve in the coming years. You see, this is the typical path for any explorer or developer in the world of mining globally, not only for Guyana. You start normally from a discovery hole, which for Eagle Mountain happened well back in the 1940s by Anaconda mining. Then obviously different times and gold regimes came in and companies from Golden Star to I Am Gold and ended up by us buying from I Am Gold the asset back in 2010. Since then, as I said, we have spent about $25 million exploring and building up this small resource at that time to what we believe now is 1.7 million ounces open in about three directions and depth to grow even bigger as the deposit. Exploration and a resource outline therefore is the stage where we are now. We have done five new discoveries in the last three years and we keep building up our portfolio of ounces in the region. The next stage is feasibility studies. 
We have initiated uh, biodiversity studies at the site now. We have done biodiversity studies in the past, but they need to be updated uh, constantly or every three years, let's put it this way, for rain and dry seasons. And of course, engineering uh, studies to say to us not only how we will mine this, how we will process this ore, and what's going to be the economic parameters about this development. Then you move into the phase of permitting, and of course, construction financing, which go in parallel, as you say, and of course, they one depends on the other. And as you notice, I have put asterisk here with a big disclaimer that subject to success, of course, this will happen. But we are very confident we are almost there, all right? Now, this process in Guyana lasts between nine and 15 months normally, with about a year average from historical applications getting into situations like Guyana Gold on Aurora project or Troy Resource on Karuni or even on the bauxite industry. And of course, the last phase is the development, the actual construction, and putting that in the time frame. As you can see here, seven to 15 years times from discovery to production. But in our case, now in mid 2022, we want to produce the necessary feasibility studies move into permitting next year uh, immediately and somehow in 2023 to 2024, potentially initiate development. I want to make a couple of uh, points here in terms of slides that, uh, you know, we see Guyana, as I will mention in the last, my last slide coming down, is challenged when it comes to infrastructure. And, and some several speakers earlier said about Georgetown, how we, you know, of course, people operate in Georgetown is the capital of the country. But when it comes to extractive industries, people want to go outside of the capital city or other big cities and find this hidden gem somewhere in the jungle or in the ocean if it's coming to petroleum, all right, for offshore applications. So the country is definitely challenged infrastructure wise in terms of the availability of roads. But we see now that uh, hopefully some of the oil funds uh, or uh, leveraging the sovereign funds from oil, uh, we see some of this money spent for improving the quality of the inland communities, but also all the extractive sector. So you see a project that 121 uh, kilometers of road from Linden to Mabura Hill has already been uh, scoped to be developed uh, with delivery date around December 2024. We feel that will help our project immensely, but also, also the whole area, because as I said, we are in a gold region, more players are coming in and Barrick just established an, a, a situation where 25 kilometers north of us are going to explore in the same region. So improvements on infrastructure are heavily welcomed. And that applies also to energy sector. And the fact that Guyana at the moment has a very expensive power when you operate the mine as such for producing 100,000 ounces a year plus. So you need a lot of power uh, when you have a, such a good quality bauxite resources in the country, it's a, it's a shame not to have the necessary power to, uh, rather than selling raw bauxite, uh, selling downstream product. I'm talking about alumina industry to be developed and potentially aluminum if you had the chance to have cheap power in the country, given that 75% of the cost of producing alumina and aluminum is electricity cost. So. We see the Amaila for hydropower being resurfaced and hopefully be developed somehow in the coming uh, five years. And of course, potentially gas to shore projects that have been scoped. And we see now some activity in terms of uh, attracting people or the government uh, uh, asking for people to submit some proposals. So we see movements, at least on these two sectors, both the road system and the uh, uh, attacking the energy problem for not only supporting the mining industry, uh, but also the manufacturing industry and a lot of other secondary sectors in Guyana. Lastly, but not least, uh, this is probably one of the most important slides here. I see uh, why we say hidden gems here. We go to the positive drivers on the left side of this diagram. We believe, first of all, is seriously underexplored. So we will see in the next five years, more and more mid-sized companies, bigger corporations from Canada, United States, Australia, Europe coming to Guyana and setting up base. So we need to prepare this ground. We are pioneers. I'm doing business in the country for about 17 years. I love Guyana. I love Guyanese people. I want to see more executives coming from Europe and investing their money in the country, giving jobs to the local people that definitely need that part. Okay. 
So we do have a federal mining act and permitting framework in comparison to other regimes in Africa, or Mongolia, or some other parts of the world. Guyana definitely stacks higher, okay? So we need to leverage out of that situation and attract more people. Guyana needs to go to all platforms to advertise itself, to the mining conferences in Toronto, in, in New York, in Melbourne, or whatever you can find a possibility to get some foreign investment in the country, you need to do that, please. We have a secular democracy based on British law, huge thing. So we are a Canadian company, we consolidate our books through auditing, independent auditing at the end of every year. So being in, a, in an environment where it's spoken English and the Commonwealth, uh, uh, part of the Commonwealth countries as Guyana has similar accounting standards to Canada, but also legal framework. So it's different to do business in Chile or Peru and having a Canadian company when in, you need to change different types of laws and merge the situation. So Guyana is very favorable from that perspective. Skill labor and history of mining for the last hundred years. Yes, indeed, some artisanal mining on low level, but there are thousands of people in Guyana that live out of mining. And we want to see more corporations to come in here and do this mining in a sustainable way. You know, get away of the use of mercury which is a toxic substance and should be banned. I mean, it is banned, but should be enforced, the banning of, of the substance. We see the com community support in comparison to other countries. We don't have social opposition to mining, which is fantastic because they see the foreign investment can create jobs and of course, participation in profits and so on through royalties and, and indirect taxation. The Caribbean community and common market is huge. You see in the countries in the European Union how they have helped one each other develop in different sectors. We want to see the same thing in, in, in Guyana, but also in the whole Caribbean community. We want to see the banking sector becoming bigger and stronger in the local frame to support local businesses. We see an increased MA activity in mining in the last two years. We have seen serious acquisitions by Colombian corporations, by Chinese corporations, by Canadian corporations bidding for projects in Guyana. That is the, normally the number one step when they, you, you, you attract, is, it shows the attractiveness of the system and the whole regime, and therefore more companies are coming. And of course, the massive oil discoveries are huge because we, although do not affect drill really mining directly, but indirectly we want to see some of these proceeds gained by the state of Guyana being used to be developing other infrastructure projects that will improve the quality of the people of Guyana in the interior of the country. Coming to the challenges, however, we see limited infrastructure, as I said, we definitely have expensive energy at the moment and no public reliable power grid to, 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 to develop your mine. So you need to burn diesel at the moment to potentially create electricity for powering your plant. And this is not environmentally friendly. So we want to see uh, there is a lot of water in the country. The power of water is well known. And, and, and Canada, particularly in Quebec or in British Columbia, all over the world, other countries, you know, produce electricity very cheaply, sustainably, and definitely without hurting the, the environment by utilizing the power of water. But at the same time, gas is producing at least one tenth of the emission that normally when you burn diesel, you produce. So we want to see also some of this gas to be exploited and develop the bauxite and, and gold industry in the country. We need to get over this historical pollution stigma. And this is big, this is big. And I hope, um, I know it's a very difficult subject because obviously you've got thousands of people in Guyana uh, operating, but it has to do with education and it's, a, it's an obligation not only by Guyanese authorities, but also by us uh, as foreign corporations to educate local people of how to do sustainable mining respecting the environment and, and the jungle environment and only destroy areas uh, that you made mine and you need to rehabilitate immediately after your mining. Do not use toxic substances that go to your water table because you pollute your kids and your future generations. So we need to improve that. And we need to have the necessary transfer of technology from these foreign corporations into the Guyanese people. It's a small population country, therefore there is a risk of competition for labor by the increasing oil industry. This will produce inflationary pressures in my opinion. And therefore we see already prices going higher in Georgetown, but hopefully we can attack this uh, 
through some proper fiscal policies from the government, but also for the foreign community in terms of assisting uh, this country that goes through transformation. You know, change is fantastic for any level, from state level to corporate level to people's private life level, but create opportunities, and we should not forget that. So we see the, the bigger picture for the coming uh, five years. We want to facilitate focused foreign investment in this sector. I would like to see some of these monies to be exploited into improvements on infrastructure and energy sector, and definitely invest in the future of your country. So tertiary education is very important. We need to improve the, the University of Guyana, create additional university, so we have more competition for trainers, for people who will come and educate the Guyanese people, who will take some of these businesses in the coming decades and make the, the coming generation flourishing and creating a fantastic country out of one of the most challenging nations at this moment in the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Yanisito, for that very exciting and expansive and educational pre presentation. I hope it, it will be available to us afterwards. Now yes, I want to hear- I will remain here, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We will now hear from Ms. Joanne Simmons, Joanna Simmons. Good morning, or should I say good afternoon to all. Thank yeah. you, Senator Wiggins and all protocols observed. Um, it has really been quite a, a, a pleasure and a good experience listening to all the foregoing discussions and presentations. And uh, it is my pleasure to present briefly, given our timeline and given that um, my presentation essentially is just setting the, the, the tone or given the idea of the, the governance framework for the petroleum sector. So I'll be quite brief so I can allow my colleague, uh, Bobby, to launch into the meat of what will be our presentation in terms of opportunities. But of course, it's always prudent to know what are the laws and, and what is the legal part of the legal construct in which people are hoping to operate. So essentially, I'm going to discuss the governance system, uh, particularly the petroleum governance framework, which is legislation uh, along with the petroleum agreement um, and Gandhi user production sharing uh, contract, uh, the licensing framework, some of the key um, regulatory activities and an idea of how that all works together. Uh, management of the petroleum sector requires a great deal of collaboration. Uh, the government is made up of, of many different agencies and ministries with different portfolios, but they all serve to work together. So we have a cohesive um, front and a cohesive way of, of, of getting the, um, the various activities uh, properly serviced and supported and of course regulated. The Ministry of Natural Resources is particularly responsible for the petroleum sector, and we provide policy, legislative, and regula regulatory oversight. From the technical perspective, we have a, a regulatory agency, the Ghana Geology and Mines Commission, which is responsible also for mining. You just heard a presentation on that, as well as uh, petroleum um, operations in particular, and they provide that daily uh, technical oversight to ensure that operations go according to agreements, according to um, the law, according to the technical specifications. The other key agencies I think are worth mentioning um, at this point as well, and for investors, investors to have an idea of is the Environmental Protection Agency. And at this time um, in the development worldwide, of course, our environmental concerns are, are quite um, at the peak. And so the Environmental Protection Agency does play a key role in the sector, um, both mining and petroleum. AMARAD uh, for offshore operations particularly implements and enforces the maritime codes, conventions, practices, and has oversight in terms of vessels and other maritime operations. The Ghana National Bureau of Standards, um, particularly in relation to petroleum uh, sector, deals with measurement and calibration authority for export of our crude and oversight of, of that process. Uh, the Guyana Revenue Authority, which regulates exports and its customs purview, and the Civil Defense Commission, which is our national focal point for oil spill preparedness planning and hopefully never having to respond, but for a response should that um, event occur. So the petroleum governance framework 
has as its umbrella uh, regula uh, law, sorry, the Petroleum Exploration and Production Act of 1986 and the regulations made there on the vote of 1986. And at this time, over the, the past uh, few years, Guyana has been um, digging in transition to now being a um, petroleum producing country. And so this law is under uh, review and under consideration for um, an upgrade to meet the present requirements and also to align with what um, obtains uh, the best and suitable instance for Guyana's development and to ensure internationally it sits well in that framework. The Petroleum Exploration and Production Act and regulations are also uh, that launching point for the issuance of uh, exploration license along with the petroleum agreement. And as most um, of you would totally agree, everyone hopes to get to that point of getting to production. Um, should there be a discovery and should that discovery be determined to be commercial um, through the process set out in the, in the act, then a production license is also issued. The, the, the production sharing agreement, the life of that agreement, of course, would span the either the exploration license or the exploration license and the production licenses as required. Um, our petroleum resources uh, remain entrusted to the state, but through this mechanism and through these uh, contracts, we then engage with contractors, international oil companies, uh, to then carry out the exploration, take that risk, work with the government. Um, and when we get to that point of production, then there is that profit share, there's that cost coverage. So essentially, um, we retain that um, sovereign oversight and responsibility for our resources. Ghana has uh, nine active um, licenses and production sharing contracts with various um, IOCs on the Starbuck block. And I think that is at this point the most um, renowned block because of the prolific discoveries. And of course, it's a producing block that we have. The Rima block, Kanji block, Arundel block, Demerara, Kanuku, Kaichor, Quarantine, and Burbies block. Um, in wrapping up, I'd like to just note that the cohesive and the, the um, ability of government to respond to the requirements of the sector as it grows and the tasks that sit with the Ministry of Natural Resources and its um, Agency the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission, as well as the related ministries and agencies that support the sector. While we may not uh, necessarily be at the forefront of conversations and investment in terms of what our portfolio doesn't seem to speak to investment, they nonetheless form and our activities uh, nonetheless form the better up for the support of the development of the country. And out of that, of course, the opportunities for investment, the certainties and the landscape. So I would like to pause or end at this point and invite um, Senator Wiggins to take us to the next presenter from the Ministry of Natural Resources. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much for that comprehensive legal report on the experiences in Guyana. We next go to Mr. Bobby Gosai Jr. for his presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Senator, and uh, to the organizers of the event, uh, colleague panelists and others on the forum. Uh, coming off of my colleague, uh, Joanna, uh, one of the things we need to emphasize on building the investment opportunity and investment growth in Guyana is that there are various programs and policies from the government of Guyana that is allowing for better uh, incentives to allow for growth in both the mining industry and the energy industry, not just the oil and gas, but energy in total. Uh, one of those uh, which I want to talk about is the uh, Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. And that is an investment incentive uh, because we are a country who was signed on to EITI. It was a long process, but we are there. We have published our second reports, uh, uh, report and we, we are moving forward. Investors on the forum will be able to tell you that once a country uh, that is involved in mining and energy and who is capable of 
uh, being able to allow investors to come in from all parts of the world. Uh, they see uh, once you are being able to be accountable in the, in the revenues that you're earning as a good indicator of a country that allows for greater economic stability. So that is a key indicator of our uh, investment uh, drive that we want to make sure that companies are, are catering for that. But focus more on the side of the oil and gas uh, for, for a minute or two. Um, we all know the discoveries. We've heard, heard of it uh, all morning uh, of what Guyana is, 20 discoveries, 20 commercial discoveries to date. Uh, development of the second field is, is on the table as we speak, moving towards the third and the fourth as we get into 2024 and 2026, they're about. This is an indication of the amount of commercial and economic activities that is coming to Guyana and will come to Guyana over the next five to seven years, so to speak. We have seen from one discoveries the amount of economic activities that have taken place, the change in landscape and the way corporate Guyana behaves as against it was pre-2015. Looking forward, we know that the development of the supply industries, the service, the offshore sector is going to be heavily demanded of the type of skills that are needed out there, as well as the type of capital investment and the goods and services that will be provided. We've heard uh, over the last hour and a half or maybe two hours about some of the challenges that we have here in Guyana. From a government point of view, those challenges are recognized. In fact, they were highly debated and presented to the public back in March of this year uh, following the uh, launch of the revised draft of the content policy, which is a policy that deals with the establishment of ensuring that there's more local participation in the local economy. There's more business growth that is taking place with partnerships and joint ventures. As we all know, we are a young economy as it relates to the energy industry or the servicing of the offshore sector. And we do need those types of investment, those types of partnerships, whether they are skills transfer or the bringing in of capital uh, into the economy to ensure that we can be able to provide and allow for a sustainable growth of the economy as well as a continuous drive in developing the offshore industry. Um, we heard of the challenges as it relates to the capital market. That has been something that has, has been on the table uh, for a number of years. Whether we were looking at the mining boom that took place uh, in the late 2000s into uh, the later period uh, heading into 2014, or we are looking at now the, the, the economic uh, activities that are taking place from the oil and gas discoveries. Raising capital in Guyana is a difficult uh, process. Uh, this is something that we have to ensure that they are right macro and uh, macroeconomic policies, whether those will be related to the monetary side or the fiscal side of the economy, is something which needs to be worked out in a very strategic manner. Um, because we need to ensure that monies are raised in country, are invested in country, and of course, are working for the country. And investors, of course, are looking to ensure that they are coming into uh, a market such as Guyana, whether they are looking to invest in the mining sector, or they're looking to invest in the oil and gas industry directly for offshore, or provision of goods and services through the supply chain of the, of the industry, that they can raise some level of capital here in country. Um, there are different programs that are being worked on that is being revisioned to look at the financial situation uh, as it relates to the institutions that are in place, as well as the mechanisms that can be improved to allow for more small scale businesses to do uh, the type of activities that are needed for the oil and gas industry in particular. Um, but while we talk about the energy sector of Guyana, we are not just focusing on what is happening uh, in the uh, oil side of things, in the extraction of the resources, we can safely say that we are also looking at the gas development in the country. The last uh, presentation um, on, on the screen indicated that the gas to power project, which is a very topical project that is on stream now with a timeline of 2024 to allow for ch cheaper energy to be distributed to the population in Guyana, whether that is in the form of the residential uh, consumption, commercial uh, consumption or manufacturing. And with the type of local content drive uh, that is happening now in Guyana, with the type of energy development that is taking place, uh, we are seeing that Guyana is moving towards an industrial state over the next five years. This is something which Guyana uh, has not experienced in decades. Uh, this, uh, when I say decades, this, this goes back for long before my time uh, when you know, we had a boom in mining industry uh, with value added such as the bauxite sector. And uh, we want to be able to ensure that Guyana can reach that, reach that potential that it needs uh, to have to ensure that it's an industrial economy. 
and with investments that are looking at not just in terms of the heavy uh, side of the oil and gas, but more on the other auxiliary services and goods that could be provided, and whether those can be produced in country instead, instead of being sourced elsewhere. I say that because you know, our emphasis is trying to build partnerships, whether those are uh, investors, also Barbados or Canada, looking to come into Guyana or elsewhere in the world, they want to ensure that they have a stable and sound uh, economy. And that must only be done through prudent policies. One of the speakers earlier spoke about uh, a country like Guyana not being able um, to protect itself from this investment boom. But one of the key things that we, we, we need to focus on in terms of policy side, whether those are from the uh, macroeconomic side or, or those are from the, the legislative side, uh, those will have to be the mechanisms that are being put in place to ensure that we do not uh, incur the effects of the Dutch disease nor the resource curse uh, syndrome. And as an economy like Guyana, uh, for the first time, we are able to have that below ground resource being uh, developed so that we can have more capital, more revenue coming into the country. It's, it's a very tempting situation for an economy to lose its way. And that's why one of the things that we, from a policy objective, from the Ministry of Natural Resources, we are working to ensure that the industry is developed in a manner that allows for diversification. And you know, this is presented in the local content policy, the draft uh, revised policy that is out there when we speak about linkages between the oil and gas sector uh, and, and, the, and the linkages from the oil and gas sector back into the economy. And then we come to the main focus of the financial linkages, the fiscal linkages, which is something we have to build on. Our financial industries in Guyana, whether they are from the banking sector, the non-banking sector, we, we heard a little about the insurance industry, it needs to be enhanced in order to cover the type of economic activity that is happening here. We don't want to be in, a, in an economy that is overheating and we can't be able to provide the type of policies and mechanisms to ensure that the economy can absorb as much as of those the, um, activities that are taking place. Uh, so all of this is working, uh, as my colleague Joanna said, you know, there are different institutions uh, that are working, there are different organizations that are working when it comes to the management of the petroleum sector. But what we, what we are seeing is not just about petroleum directly, it's about the related services and related industries in ensuring that you have a viable industry that is taking place. So over the last five years, we have seen a lot of changes in the Guyanese economy, particularly with the establishment of new industries and the provision of new goods and services. The ways in which we view Guyana pre-2015 to the ways in which we view it now, uh, we like to say we are no longer just uh, a small economy. We are a player in the region. Uh, you would hear from our uh, legislative side and key policy makers about Guyana becoming an energy hub. In fact, one of the key development for business opportunities is linking Guyana and Serena, uh, which is right next door to ensure that Guyana becomes an energy corridor uh, with respect to the development of the deep offshore industries that are taking place. And with Guyana in particular, you know, 20 discoveries and over 9 billion barrels of oil as one representative from the operators said, you know, it, it, it would be unwise for a company of that nature to walk away from Guyana because of the potential that we have over time. You know, from, uh, from an economic uh, point of view, if you were to take all of, all of the fields that, uh, that have been, or all of the discoveries that have been done in the standard block alone, and you, uh, you uh, forecast and you do an economic model, you would know that Guyana uh, has uh, recoverable reserves well into the 2060s. So you're looking at a transformative development agenda for, for this economy, and not one that is just transactional in terms of the day-to-day -day business. So the opportunities range from whether you're talking about human resources development, from the provision of services, from whether you want to tap into the agricultural base or the ICT base or the agro-processing base of Guyana or the transportation or the construction sector or even the mining industry. Uh, it's, it's wide. Um, there's a lot of opportunities that the oil and gas sector is bringing with us uh, here for Guyana. And just a little on the, the, the topical uh, point of the gas to energy project, you know, that, that is a project that we want to see a lot of local investment. We want to see the partnerships in terms of the technology and the skills that we don't have here. You know, it's the first time that Guyana is going to be having a project of this nature, of this magnitude, with uh, coming from offshore inland and the development of a new industrial base in the country, uh, one which will be looking to have more value added manufacturing and, of course, take the country to the next stage of being uh, an, an economic um, 
uh, an economy that is sustainable in terms of the economic viability of continuous growth over the next five to 10 years. So uh, those, that's a summary uh, in, in essence of what we are working on uh, from the government side. And you know, there are opportunities that we can get into more specifically uh, as the forum opens. So thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Gosai, for that comprehensive uh, chat. We have three questions for you um, in the chat. Should, do you want to take them one by one or all three at a time? All right, I, I, I will take them. Um, the, uh, I'll take the first one on the clean energy sector. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, good, uh, a good indication. Uh, in Guyana, we like to say we want to have an ecological balance in the development of the economy. Uh, many of you would know that uh, throughout the history of Guyana, we have always been an environmentally conscious economy. Uh, whether we come in from the 70s or the 80s, 90s, all the way forward. In fact, uh, every head of state of Guyana has taken on the agenda of the environment, the protection and the ensure, uh, protection of the environment, protection of our native lands, and as well as the continuous sustainable growth of the environment in which we have. We would all know that Guyana has very big uh, rainforests. We, have, we also have a very uh, large commercial forest sector, but at the same time, we make commitments to international convention that will allow that we do not uh, uh, put forward uh, heavy uh, activities in our forests. Uh, we do not go above a certain level of deforestation and we stick to our agreement. Um, you would all know that uh, a few years back, we had signed an agreement with Norway, uh, which was the first LCDS. Um, we also had the Green State Development Strategy, and now we're working on the second uh, low carbon development strategy moving forward. So the clean en energy sector is high on our agenda as we look towards the establishment of solar farms. We look towards the development of hydroelectric power in the country just this weekend. Uh, the advertisement went out for the expression of interest on the Amila Falls Hydro Project, which is something that the government is looking to put on the agenda. So while we are working on the oil and gas industry, we are also working on a proper energy mix that will allow for uh, net neutrality. Um, as we would like to see in Guyana, we are already a carbon sink, but net neutrality in terms of our energy development and, and, and our industrial development. Um, the second question is um, offshore wind, is on offshore wind. Now, uh, there, there are some studies that have been done over the years on the development of wind farms in Guyana. Um, if you take a look at the, at, the, at the world wind map, you would notice that there are strategic locations where Guyana can develop uh, wind energy. So our energy mix uh, does include um, solar, hydro, as well as wind. Uh, my apologies for the four there. And the um, third question uh, is the ministry concerned about climate change, uh, emission reduction, and energy transition, uh, how that will affect the uh, petroleum sector, and also stranded assets. Uh, that's, a, that's a heavy question. There's a lot of things in that question, but I'll, I will answer it. And then the second part is, uh, the ministry uh, perceived to take measures, mitigate or circumvent the threats. Of course, um, you know, um, we all know uh, the, the emissions issue. Uh, that is the flaring uh, offshore. We had an issue there. The government stepped in and put uh, certain uh, measures in place to ensure that uh, this does not reoccur and also to put a fine uh, where necessary on, on the emissions that are taking place. With the strategies that have been developed over Guyana, as we call them the, our economic development strategies, over the last two decades, the prime focus of Guyana's economic development has been on the issue of environmental sustainability uh, as it relates to the protection of our rainforest, protection of our coastal zone. As we all know, we are below sea level, we are uh, vulnerable to rising sea levels. Um, we are uh, cognizant of the fact that even though we are a carbon sink because of the uh, rainforest that we have, we are also moving into the direction where we want to have more manufacturing in our economy. And of course, we have an offshore industry that is, uh, that is producing some level of emissions. Um, but when you look at the strategies that have been put in place and the policy guidance, they all take into account climate change, mitigating the effects of climate change 
for our country. And you hear this every day when you look at the transfer, transformative agenda that has been spoken about from every sector or every component. We, when you're looking at the development of new industrial areas, you're looking at the development of new uh, infrastructure, development of new communities, it's, it's taking Guyana and changing the, the geographic uh, location of where the economic activities are happening here. Earlier, we heard that everyone wants to come to Georgetown, but we are moving in the direction of creating new communities, new urban centers that uh, will not be so uh, vulnerable to the effects of climate change, particularly uh, rising sea levels and, and heavy rainfall. So yes, uh, the ministry is doing its part as it relates to the mining and, um, or I should say the extractive sectors in general. And there are also other agencies such as the Ministry of Agriculture, um, the, the Civil Defense Commission, the uh, Office of the President to the Climate Change and Environmental Unit that is working to ensure that we have policies that can be rolled out to ensure that uh, the country as a whole and the economy is protected from uh, environmental degradation and the effects of climate change. As we all know that this will become a topical issue come November when the world meets in Glasgow uh, to debate again on the emissions that are happening and the, and the, and the signing on on the, uh, on the new protocol for, for, for the world as it relates to how we advance ourselves in, uh, uh, in an economy, in a world global economy that is coming out of a pandemic and one that is also heavily based on a more efficient energy mix as well as one that is moving towards uh, net zero carbon emission. Uh, but for, for an emerging economy uh, like Guyana, we are focused, we are focusing more on net neutrality as it relates to the, uh, the, the carbon emission that is taking place from the various sectors that are driving this economy uh, that, or that has been driving this economy over the last uh, five to seven years. Thank you so much, Bobby. Mr. Yanisito, there's a question for you in the chat. Um, Mr. Mayor said he's looking at the location of the mine and was wondering what your thoughts were around energy infrastructure to support the mining operations. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, we are, we are in central Guyana, uh, almost eight kilometers away of Madia town. Uh, they, you know, the energy requirements for uh, the beauty of, of Eagle Mountain is that because of the presence of gold very shallow uh, on, on surface or near surface or the majority of it, uh, you can stage the development. So you don't need to have from day one uh, the full energy requirements that you may, uh, you may need in year six or seven of the operation. And hopefully in parallel to what my other co-speakers spoke here, the country is developing itself on this sector, uh, on the energy sector. So when it comes to, you know, uh, consumption from a mine, a gold mine particularly, uh, you know, you, you look into probably closer to about 10 megawatts situation uh, for a, a, a decent sized gold mine, uh, you know, when both copper or some other commodities, the, the, the needs are huge and much higher than that. So uh, relatively speaking, the gold uh, mine doesn't require that much, about 10 megawatts. Obviously the Amaila Falls, if it's going to be developed is very close to our project. So when it comes to energy, there are two elements. The one is production of, uh, of course, the electricity in terms of a sustainable way. But the other thing is the transmission and, and um, you know, where, how can we connect ourselves to the grid? So hopefully that will develop the whole region of Maria. Uh, region 8 Potaro can be developed in addition to our mine. So so once we bring some transmission lines to this area. So from our perspective, we, we try to do the best when we will do the necessary engineering studies to develop um, uh, a regime where even in the interim, we may develop some power uh, in a way that is sustainable and possibly, if possible, carbon neutral. But we'll see how it goes that, uh, you know, obviously it's a, it's a changing environment, as I said, and uh, we are very happy to be as part of that changing environment, right, in the next three to five years. Thank you, sir. A question here from Ms. Joanna Simmons. Venezuela keeps citing a claim to some Guyana territory. Are there any territorial matters that can impede the development of the oil industry? Ms. Joanna Simmons? 
Sorry, apologies. I was reading and they questioned this and um, missed the mute button. My best response at this time, um, and as you'd appreciate, government is just not one ministry, but an entire connection of various um, governmental arms. And the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is leading in relation to this particular subject area. From the Ministry of Natural Resources perspective, however, we continue to progress development of the sector. And um, I think that given the scope of discussion this morning, that um, this afternoon, that we are definitely making um, steady and manifest progress. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. I think you can answer the next question in the chat about listing on the Diana Stock Exchange so that only Guyanese can invest in the Eagle Mountain project. Um, we, this is, a, that's for me, I guess, correct? Go ahead, so, Mr. Yes, Mr. yes. Thank you, yes I'm thinking, yes. Yeah, um, look, we should consider that at some point, you know, I mean, uh, the Canadian platform of the exchange, uh, obviously some discussions have to take place here with Toronto Stock Exchange, but they allow secondary listings. For example, we are primarily listed in Canada, but we've got secondary listing already in the United States and Germany. So to potentially list ourselves in Guyana, uh, you know, will, could become a reality. I need to find more details about that process and how could materialize. Because the biggest problem is not really the listing uh, and the trading platform, is more as some speaker before from a banking sector mentioned that uh, you need to have uh, transparency to the uh, share depository and how the shares will exchange. So the Guyanese people will avoid to have double fees by using a broker in Guyana and a broker in Canada. In Canada. So, we, we need to find a ways where uh, computer share or some of these big institutions that are handling our shares when uh, they change every day in, in thousands of transactions in the stock exchanges, how people in Guyana will achieve right away a certificate of some shareholding in, in uh, goals of mines. But it is feasible and could become pioneering. And uh, definitely I will put my notes here to investigate that possibility. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Joanna, will the government be offering any special incentives or, CARICOM, or concessions to CARICOM-based firms? I'll actually revert to Bobby since he is one of our lead teams in relation to local content. Bobby? Uh, thanks, Joanna. Thanks, Joanna. It's, it's, um, it's a good question. Um, the reality is we are part of a common block of countries. We are part of a common um, market. Um, and within the local content policy that we have prepared and uh, currently uh, revising to put, bring to the final stage, uh, the conditions of what we have in CARICOM and our agreements are taken into account. Um, right now, uh, there is a policy, uh, of course, uh, uh, any CARICOM member state can come, uh, anyone from any CARICOM member state can come and open business in Guyana. Uh, there is no restriction on that uh, at this point in time, but we are not part of a common economy. So our local content policy will take account of that. While we do allow for investment and partnerships to develop, the emphasis is to ensure that there's growth of the local industry and, of course, contribution to our revenue base. Thank you, Bobby. As we wrap up, this is the very last question. What efforts are in place to prevent too large a gap to develop between the oil and other sectors with respect to labor resources, incomes, and prices? Yeah, um, that, that that is that that is a key question again. Again, so as I said, we are working on ensuring that we don't become a one commodity type uh, economy, and we don't become dependent on the oil and gas sector. So. What is happening right now uh, in Guyana, for example, there's a construction boom and we are trying to bring the policies that we're driving the oil and gas sector into that area as well so that workers, the labor force themselves can see opportunities in different sectors of the economy. And of course, making sure that the wages are comparable and competitive to ensure that people can can see the different opportunities and benefits of working, especially if you're skilled. At the same time, we are also training and retraining persons to work in the different sectors. There's a big drive in Guyana right now to ensure that our vocational and technical institutions can provide the necessary skills that we need uh, for the different sectors, especially as we move into manufacturing and agro-processing. Um, prices, uh, we uh, pride ourselves in saying that we are a market uh, economy. Uh, 
there are there are no uh, definitive uh, price control mechanism in Guyana as it relates to goods and services, but we are taking account of the fact that we don't want to see uh, prices escalate uh, beyond a certain level just because income are generating uh, more, or people have more spending and power. This goes back to the effects of the resource curse syndrome. So the types of tax incentives that we are providing in place, as well as the mechanism to ensure that our banking sector can be able to absorb uh, more levels of investment are some of the key measures that the government is working on to ensure that we don't uh, have uh, high inflationary uh, tendencies in the country because of increased revenue that is coming in. But it can be more of a pro-investment type economy, whether that is looking for large-scale investment or small-scale business growth. Thank you so very much, Mami Gosai. And I want to thank all my panelists. This is a general thank you for participating today in this seminar. And I personally want to thank Biba and of course, uh, Invest Barbados and the Canada Diana Chamber of Commerce for inviting me to host these three panels. I now hand over to Natalia and Derek Cummins for the final thank yous and wrap up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Senator Wiggins. Um, I want to uh, thank High Commissioner Berman and High Commissioner Chatterjee for setting the tone of today's um, panel discussion and seminar about investments um, available in Guyana, as well as our panelists today for sharing their knowledge and expertise. Special thanks, of course, to our moderator, Senator Wiggins, uh, who led, I think, a very uh, vigorous discussion with a, a lot of deafness. So thank you very much, Senator. Um, I want to say, I want to close off by saying that I think that the theme of this interaction and as it, as we went through every speaker and uh, questions asked, et cetera, is that there needs to be cooperation um, and partnership. I hope that the seminar has highlighted uh, synergies for investment activities and business and uh, future exploration between Canada, Guyana, Barbados, and um, you know our participants that may be from other jurisdictions. If you'd like to learn more about the Canada-Guyana Chamber of Commerce, you can contact us at info at, CG, at cgcc.gy. Additionally, if you'd like to make contact with any of our speakers today or even fellow attendees um, at this seminar, please reach out to us and let us know. You can visit our website at cgcc.gy and you can reach us at 592-693-5137 to let us know your thoughts on this uh, webinar and others you'd like to see us do in the future. Once again, thank you everyone for taking the time um, to be here today and thank you so much for your very insightful um, interactions. Yes. Um, um, Thank you very much. Mr. Ram has um, got to mute his mic. <clears throat> I would just want to second everything that Natalia said just now and to thank all the participants for today. I'm very excited about the opportunities and about all that I've heard, I've heard today. I'm looking forward to working some more with the chamber and definitely working with Invest Barbados. Again, like Natalia said, you can also get this information from the BIBA Secretariat and also from the Invest Barbados, um, investbarbados.com and the BIBA website, of course. This, um, today's session will be uploaded on, on the BIBA YouTube channel. You can visit our website to get that information and you can go over it again. And also I'm sure we all very excited about the possibilities. I want to thank the Secretariat at Bieber for working diligently with Natalia, who I know uh, from all the communications have also worked diligently. And Renata at Invest Barbell have worked really hard to make this happen. Grace Chambers and the Business Development Officer at Bieber and the team, I really want to thank you all for, for, for making this happen. And 
you know, I was sitting here wondering um, if they weren't, if you weren't under COVID, maybe we have tried to do this by all traveling to one jurisdiction and making it a whole lot more difficult to put this on. The reality of, of, of what we're in now, we, we are able to do this today quite simply. And I'm looking forward, Natalia, for the next session where we can delve further into some specific areas that we've spoken of here today. So definitely just want to say all stay tuned. Anything else for you, Natalia? No, okay. I just, I, once again, thank you so much, um, everyone. And definitely to the Invest Barbados and the, um, the Biba team. Um, I think that this has been a wonderful collaborative effort. And I'm hoping to see more collaborative efforts between Canada, Guyana, and Barbados in the future. Fantastic. And to our participants, thank you all for staying with us and for participating in the session. Looking forward to interacting with you all going forward. Thank you all and goodbye.